Well, I would like to welcome you to day four of the conference. I'm happy to start this day off for you, and I would like to thank the organizers of MCM 22. Uh, it's been a great week so far. Um, I have been uh, amazed at all the connections between different talks and also relating to my talk. Um, for the first three days of the conference, I've been adding slides and now I found that the night before my talk, I was deleting a bunch of slides because there were too many. So let's see if we can get through these. So I'm going to start with um, some motivation uh, questions and background, uh, B spline definitions and properties, and a software demo of my uh, spline modeling of audio signals, and then uh, the cycle interpolation, um, patching the cycle, these models um, that uh, I'll show you and then also some small models and models and timbre blending. So first of all, motivation coming from level of detail, which I've been thinking about for some time. Um, you can see in this picture a, um, a model of a, of a rabbit with um, si almost 70,000 triangles, um, and then lower resolution models. Uh, finally, one with very few triangles, only 17. Um, what are these good for? Well, in um, Multimedia such as uh, real-time uh, video games and, and other graphics media, uh, this can be a, a huge savings if, in fact, you are looking at smaller models um, in the distance. Uh, you can save not only um, the size in memory, but also the processing time, etc. Um, so you can think of it uh, in, in this picture now. Um, if these smaller rabbits are running around in the background, um, you know what the, you still know they're rabbits. Um, and if you want to see what the the rabbit looks like, of course you can look at the one that's close up. Um, and so one big question that I've had for years is 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 there an analogy of this kind of pipeline for audio? So um, the graphical models can be simplified. Right by removing vertices, polygons, uh, textures, etc. Um, and what is the what is the digital audio analogy uh, for that? So we need to be able to render directly from the model data. So that's one thing here is we're not talking about compression. Uh, compression of audio files is wonderful, and, and uh, but one has to compress and then store it right to disk and then decompress. And we're talking about something different here as you can already see in the uh, graphic models. Those are not compressed models, they are simplified models. So how do we simplify? Um, I'm proposing in this paper that at least one direction can be that we can remove samples and replace with spline curves so that um, those spline curves will represent pieces of the audio signal. Um, and then we can also remove entire cycles and replace those with interpolated cycles. Here I'm using the word cycle rather loosely. What does it mean? Uh, we'll see if we can we can uh, hone in on that and give some definitions and um, practical uh, computation of what we're referring to as cycles. Another <clears throat> motivation comes from timbre. Um, as we know, uh, when you look at a, a visual image and you've simplified it, you've made a, a lower resolution model, you want to uh, at least preserve some of the shape what is it that we want to preserve with audio? Well, there are some simple things like um, pitch, if we're preserving something of a musical nature, um, perhaps envelope of a sound, but the timbre can be much more complicated. Um, as we saw in Maria's talk earlier, um, question, can we, can we actually preserve timbre by extracting uh, smaller chunks of an audio signal, or in other words, simplifying to a lower resolution signal? Um, Timbre is multidimensional, um, as, as has been supported by psychoacoustic experiments, and um, questions, can we give a uh, discrete representation or a basis for timbre? That's another thing we can think about by constructing these types of models. Um, splines and synthesis has been around for a while. Many people have experimented with um, graphical models where uh, you can see here a picture of, let's say, one um, cycle which is then repeated and control points, and you can move these around, either have a, having a polynomial graph or maybe a piecewise polynomial or spline graph, and then changing the timbre as the um, sound wave uh, or one cycle or period of the, of the signal is changing. Um, we can also think of splines as audio generators. For instance, a square wave is just a degree zero um, spline with 
uh, two subintervals per cycle. Um, same thing with all of these are two subintervals per cycle or two polynomial pieces. Um, triangle wave is an integral of a square wave. If we integrate again, we get a parabolic sinusoid and then a cubic sinusoid. So I like to refer to these as splinusoids. Um, here they are uh, just pictured with also uh, their spectral decay indicated. Um, this very slow decay of the square wave, 1 over n, uh, then a 1 over n square for the triangle wave, and that just continues on. Uh, we can integrate each of these and come up finally with the um, cubic wave with a, a, a much higher, uh, quicker spectral decay of 1 over n to the fourth. Another motivation um, has been for me working with a couple of colleagues, um, Paul Lanthier and Rudolphe Boret, on the uh, UPI sketch project. Um, here, uh, the splines are used for uh, graphically generating uh, curves for things, for instance, like uh, pitch. And uh, we've talked about um, various uh, goals with UPI Sketch in, in incorporating timbre into their uh, uh, usage of splines as well. Yet another motivation coming from graphics is animation. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the basic idea of keyframing. Um, you create uh, keyframes drawn or perhaps captured. Um, it also applies in the case of motion capture. Um, then in-between frames are generated. They may be drawn. They may be um, interpolated with some um, uh, software, uh, computed, and so on. Um, we can also have discrete representations like wireframes or articulated skeletons. In audio, we can think of cycles as being created or designed or captured, and that's uh, the the take that I the approach that I take in in this work is to capture audio cycles from an, a recorded sample. Um, in between cycles can then be generated by interpolation. And that's the method that I'm using here, and uh, we can also then have a discrete representation of each of those cycles, which is the set of B spline coefficients for those cycles. Um, Finally, I, I want to just mention here that this paper uh, is part of a series of three papers. This one is the more, the more basic um, uh, foundational uh, version of this spline modeling. And then there was the paper that I just presented with Paul Lantier in France at SMC, and that was more focused on timbre and cell cellular automata. And then um, the third one is focusing, focusing more on level of detail for audio, and that's in uh, SIGMAP next month. Okay, let's do some background on spline functions. Uh, very briefly, um, we can start with the truncated power function. This is the way De Boer does it and the way I like to approach splines. Uh, very simple uh, piecewise polynomial, zero to the left of C and uh, T minus C to the K to the right. Um, if we take two cubic polynomials and uh, we want them to match at C both in their uh, value, first derivative and second derivative, um, then in fact, that difference of those polynomials is very much uh, looking like already a truncated power function. Of course, it's just a polynomial at this point. Um, but this allows us to then construct bases from uh, these truncated uh, power functions. So for instance, um, if you have a sequence of three cubic polynomials, let's say P1, P2, and P3, um, and there's a sequence of intervals on the integers from 0 to 3 as the endpoints, uh, we can then create a C2 function agreeing at value first and second derivative at each of the intermediate points, which, which are just one and two. And we can write it as any cubic polynomial that will cover the first interval. And then the change in the polynomial or the difference is covered by that uh, term with the a4. And then the final um, uh, term with the a5 covers the change over the uh, value or the breakpoint two. <coughs> so equivalently, we can also just write this uh, this a function as a sum of truncated power functions where I've simply rewritten those first polynomial terms as truncated power functions uh, with the c value of 0. And then we can uh, write this all of these types of functions um, with a basis of truncated power functions. You see the repeated use of the 0. Um, in this case, that then gives us a shorthand for the basis, uh, which would be uh, four zeros, one, two as a not sequence, and that's how I like to think of not sequences, really they're just um, abbreviations for uh, spline bases. Working with cubic uh, B splines then, um, any basis spline is a linear combination of five consecutive truncated power functions. 
um, which correspond to five consecutive not values in the sequence. So for instance, uh, the first B spline is just those four zeros and the one, and gives us a sum of those uh, five truncated power functions. Um, we then can represent any F of T as above uh, this cubic spline as a, um, a sum of basis B splines according to this not sequence. So each of those uh, B splines again is, a, is corresponding to five consecutive not values. The last one then is the two, three, 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 and so on. We get different B splines associated to those different um, sequences. All right, some B-spline formulas to just uh, review quickly. Um, if we use this interval sequence, so we literally, our functions are, in fact, um, sequences of cubic polynomials agreeing um, with the C2 condition on each of those intermediate values. Um, we can use this not sequence with the four zeros and the four ones on either end. And uh, cubic B-splines then associated to that are defined with a divided difference formula. Um, that bracket operator using the dummy variable x and the t constant is uh, as a divided difference. And then we get the B-spline recursion formula, or what's called the de Bourcox recursion. Um, all of the B-splines can then be generated in this recursive way, with the base case, uh, the signature function on any one interval. And finally, also the um, de Bohr algorithm uh, comes from that B-spline recursion. Uh, essentially, we can take the coefficients for the, a, a sum of B-splines, uh, the coefficient CI, um, given the superscript of zero, and then we have a um, nested linear interpolation um, for any T value located some, somewhere in relation to those knots, uh, gives us then a recursive um, or a nested linear interpolation of the coefficients based on the not values and the t value. And our final values then just get our, our actual output of the sum of these points is given in this way with nested linear interpolation. So it's a highly efficient and very fast uh, way to evaluate a spline function. And it's often diagrammed in this way um, just <clears throat> with the nested linear interpolation indicated by these arrows. All right, next I would like to give uh, a, this software demo. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about zero crossings and cycle shading, then the um, B-spline interpolation of one cycle, um, the basic spline model for an audio sample that's with an, without cycle interpolation, and then the regular cycle interpolation and how this can cause what we refer to as some singularities. Here is our spline modeling software written with juice. We have opened an audio signal, which is a guitar pluck of about one and a half seconds in length, with fundamental frequency approximately 450 hertz, which sounds like this. The sample rate is 44,100 samples per second, which gives an estimate of 98 samples per cycle. We use this estimate to compute cycles based on zero crossings, which are closest to the number of samples. The number of samples per cycle is shown at the bottom of each cycle. We can see that even in the attack phase of this signal, there is already a fairly stable sequence of cycles varying around the guess of 98 samples per cycle. We can change the frequency guess to 225, which is equivalent to 196 samples per cycle, to reinterpret the signal with fundamental frequency one octave lower. Here the pattern of samples per cycle is slightly more stable. Our goal is to model each cycle with a cubic spline curve and to attempt to reduce the amount of data in this model by tracking the gradual evolution of cycles. Let's zoom in now on one cycle. Here is cycle three, which has 109 samples in its interval. The signal graph is treated as a continuous piecewise linear function so that we can compute zero crossings between samples as the interval endpoints. For the cubic spline interpolation, we subdivide the cycle interval uniformly into k subintervals. Here is the spline in blue with k equals 30 subintervals, also showing the interpolation points in red. And here it is with k equals 12 subintervals. So we can more clearly see the difference between the spline and the audio graph. If you count the red dots or interpolation points, which we also call targets, you will find that there are 13, not 12. These together with the endpoints make up a total of 15 or k plus three targets 
which matches the dimension of the vector space of C2 cubic splines on this sequence of k subintervals. To find the cubic spline, we use a linear system to solve for the b-spline coefficients. With our choice of knot sequence, the first and last coefficients are 0, which is equivalent to requiring value 0 at the endpoints. So in this example, we only need to solve for 13 coefficients using the 13 red dots or targets. We display here each of the 13 b-splines scaled with their non-zero coefficient, which sum together to give the resulting spline. Next, we compute the basic model, which means that we compute the spline model on each cycle with some fixed choice of k sub-intervals. For this example, with k equals 30, it takes about 34 seconds, which we've already done. We graph the model again in blue and see that it is a very good match to the signal. This is confirmed by comparing the original audio and the model audio. Next, we point out a type of discontinuity in the cycle shape, which is a consequence of our naive choice of cycles based on zero crossings. In particular, let's look at the region around cycle 360. Here we can see that the waveform is evolving smoothly, just as it does through the sample. However, our choice of cycle endpoints causes a type of singularity, or shape discontinuity, as we progress through cycle 360. Before the singularity, the cycles appear to be made up of a large sinusoid shape, followed by a smaller one. But after the singularity, the opposite happens, since the smaller sinusoid shape has moved above the time axis. A similar singularity happens at cycle 380, and these are the only two such occurrences in this audio sample. Next, we look at the cycle interpolation model in this example. Here we choose m equals 5 and leave k equals 30, which means that we compute spline models only for every fifth cycle, and the intermediate cycle's b-spline coefficients are computed by linear interpolation. The green shaded cycles are called key cycles, with the spline models computed, and the rest are called non-key or intermediate cycles, which are interpolated. Even though the intermediate cycles are clearly not matching closely to the original signal, we can see that they are progressing smoothly between key cycles when we turn off the original signal graph. But when we get close to cycle 360, we can see the effect of the singularity. This happens again at cycle 380. In these two cases, the oscillation of the small sinusoid feature of the graph is not captured well by the choice of cycles based on zero crossings. We can hear the distortion which comes from these two singularities when we compare the original audio to the model audio. Note that the first half of the model audio is a pretty good match with the distortion happening in the middle. Here again is the original, and here is the cycle interpolation model. All right, let me continue. Um, and talk a little bit about the patching. So there are a couple of options um, to do at those singularities uh, where the cycle shape is changing drastically because of the choice of, of cycles based on zero crossings. So one thing is we can add some more key cycles on either side, for instance, of the singularity. Um, this can smooth the transition of the cycles, but it doesn't really solve um, the underlying issue completely. Um, we can also take a different approach of removing some key cycles. Essentially, that would mean um, near the singularity, um, remove cycles and just allow the interpolation to progress um, across that cycle. It's another approach, um, having a longer interpolation sequence. Different types of uh, interpolation as well, um, just to point out. Regular, just of course, just means um, every mth cycle is a key cycle and everything in between is um, interpolated. And that can be good for um, things like filtering and, and mixing of signals um, using the same exact same regular uh, interpolation. Another approach is, is very natural as well, having a left biased um, set of key cycles, more dense at the beginning, and this is uh, often um, appropriate for things like attack decay type sounds. So let's take a look at the um, singularity again. And now just see, for instance, those keys or those interpolated cycles in between, let's say 355 and 360. Um, those are clearly not 
matching um, the curve and in fact they're getting more and more off um, in the middle it's because of course this this shape here is really quite different than this shape with the extra um, small sinusoid uh, feature on the right here it's missing completely and has been um, dropped into the next cycle another thing I didn't point out in the video was that in fact the um, the length of cycle has really dropped drastically suddenly here uh, they've typically been oscillating around 98 samples and this one drops all the way down to 82 and of course it's quite clear that um, it's because it's missed um, the zero corresponding to that um, small feature moving up above the uh, time axis okay so uh, again if we look at the signal there of course is no problem with the signal here it has to do with the zero crossings and the um, declaration of where we put those cycle endpoints um, and here you can see, of course, just with this, the model alone, you can see that it really is changing quite drastically through that um, so, uh, that uh, cycle number 360. Here it is patched on either side. Um, it does seem to be um, solving some of the issue there. Again, if we look at the, the signal and then uh, look at the model, um, it, the model does appear to be um, smoother now, but again, it still is changing from one side of the uh, singularity to, to the other, which still will cause some audio artifacts as well. And, and then another uh, singularity, the only other one really of this type in this audio sample is at 380, and here we see a different type of, of issue with two um, features on either side of this cycle that are not matching the cycles on either side. And again, here's, here's the signal, and then here's the um, model, how the model looks there. Um, <clears throat> and then here, the, here is, again, the, this cycle patched on either side. All right, well, defects of cycle interpolation, clearly we're seeing that um, by restricting to zero crossings, we can get these types of singularities. Um, also, cycles should oscillate in a natural way. This is something that... Um, if you look at the endpoints of the cycles, uh, the, those uh, small features of the small, what I call the small sinusoid, is oscillating as well. Um, and not only not only the graph is oscillating, but those features are oscillating. Um, the linear interpolation of B-spline coefficients doesn't capture this. This is understandable uh, because, in fact, we are um, not uh, baking in an oscillation into the interpolation of the B-spline coefficients. That's actually just linear, at least for this first approach. Um, we can also be missing subharmonics. Um, again, this is exactly the same issue um, if, in fact, cycles are oscillating um, at some frequency lower than the uh, fundamental, then that's not going to be picked up when you do cycle interpolation. So all of this points towards something which I developed after this paper was uh, accepted for publication, and that's what I call the Delta model, but I will just give a brief summary of it here um, since it kind of is pointing towards the, the, a better solution for the, sing, uh, the singularities that we've been looking at. Um, so we want to allow endpoints to be at any point on the signal graph. Um, to do that, I express each cycle as a sum of a single cubic polynomial plus a spline and it decouples the B-spline model from the endpoints then. Those endpoints are always then um, given some value, which we call delta, the difference between the Y value at the uh, two endpoints of the cycle. Um, it allows for more similarity between cycles with different heights, accounted for by those B-spline coefficients, and it allows us more easily to preserve the continuity of the cycle shape. So what do I do? Uh, we begin, begin with a small, of, <laughs> a small number of cycles based on zero crossings. Um, we project an endpoint uh, for cycle C sub i um, based on the frequency guess. That's what I was doing before, but then I would always go for the closest zero crossing. Now instead, um, we compute some error functions. So we project the B-spline coefficients from the previous cycle onto the current cycle with the given endpoint that is is given by this guess. And um, we compute an error functional there um, with the values y0 and y1 for that cycle with the guess of the um, endpoint. And then we compute this for various nearby values and uh, find a, a minimal version of that. So this will be, um, for instance, just a handful of samples near that endpoint to determine where would be the most appropriate place to, uh, to put the endpoint of the cycle.
and we, we do that by this uh, minimization. So the, the, delta, the uh, delta cubic, that single cubic polynomial, then um, that accounts for the, uh, the lift at the endpoints, or going above and below the uh, time axis. Um, that's just this cubic polynomial here. Um, it has a derivative 0 at the two ends, and just raises up or down very much just accommodating for that lift. Um, we can also convert that into b-spline form using the polar form, which is a very handy uh, thing to do as well. And th that way, its b-spline coefficients can just be baked into the cycle as well. That's what the delta cubic looks like um, with given values. And th those are its control points. Uh, that's the b-spline, or the, um, sorry, the uh, Bernstein polynomial form there below, uh, just with the two coefficients, y0 and y1. And then, as I said, this uh, does a cycle comparison. It compares the b-spline coefficients for the previous cycle to the current one. Um, and then the cycle itself is just represented in the delta model as the coefficients of the b-spline, as well as those two endpoint values. Now let's just see how this actually does smooth out the singularity. Here's a picture of the, um, the delta model. And the key cycles, again, are in green. Uh, they will be a slightly different shade of green on the next graph, on the next um, uh, image. But you can see that the, the blue curve is just overwriting the, um, the signal graph, the gray curve here, and then also in each of these. In between, you do see this, the uh, gray curve, the original signal sticking out slightly, um, so there's definitely a difference between the two. But what's happening here at cycle 360 now is the two endpoints have been adjusted slightly by the, um, this uh, minimization process. And so we have the cycle shape is now really basically preserved. We have the small sinusoid lifted up here, the large sinusoid at the beginning, and the same basic pattern here. Um, so this is what it look, this is what the signal graph looks like with those cycle endpoints determined by the delta model. And then uh, here is what the model looks like as well. And again, same thing for cycle 380 where we had the other singularity. You can see that those endpoints have shifted up and down. All right, next thing I want to do is, is play from the, um, the demo a, a collection of sounds that are, are computed with that same guitar pluck, but with different models. Um, the basic model, remember, is just the one that computes a sign on every single cycle, and it's expected to be quite close to the original sound. These three in the middle are the ones that, that have the most uh, defects in terms of audio artifacts. The cycle, the cycle interpolation with m equals 5, every fifth cycle is key. And then uh, even with the patching, doesn't make actu actually a, a big improvement. Um, and then this is the one, the third one here in the middle, is the one that avoids patching. And it simply um, uses longer sequences to uh, go over that uh, singularity. Again, not a huge improvement, very small amount of data in that model. And then finally, the last one is the delta model. So that's the one that um, does succeed slightly better in, in terms of reducing the audio artifacts. Original recorded sound. Basic model with k equals 30. Cycle interpolation with k equals 30, m equals 5. Adding patches around cycles 360 and 380. Fibonacci cycle interpolation with k equals 30, 15 key cycles. Delta model with Fibonacci cycle interpolation, k equals 30, 15 key cycles. And here they are again in the same sequence. Right, finally I want to give a few examples of timbre blending, um, and in order to do that I'll talk about 
what I call these small models of, of several instruments. Um, we, for each of these, we used a one-second sample with uh, standard sample rate 44,100. I used k, k equals 30 for the number of subintervals per cycle, and that gives us 33 B-spline coefficients per cycle. That's the dimension. And the cycle lengths are then um, normalized, and so that means that I'm not uh, taking the, the cycle lengths from the actual uh, recorded sample anymore, as we saw in the guitar plug. Those did vary. Um, but in this case, we're just normalizing those, which is easy to do since we have um, just those those standard uh, number of 33 B-spline coefficients per cycle and then just evaluate according to how many cycles per second we want. Um, and then the endpoints are also just normalized to go back to zero. Even though a delta model is used, we can just simply use the B-spline coefficients uh, to simplify the model. And this turns out with those requirements to be about 1.3% of the original amount of data. So I'm just talking about, instead of 44,100 uh, values, uh, the number of values needed to construct the model. In other words, just the 33 B-spline uh, coefficients um, per uh, cycle, and then there are 18 key cycles um, that we chose. This gives about 1.3% of the data. So we did this for 33 instruments. Um, each one is just one recorded sample. As I said, 18 key cycles are used. We use a delta model uh, with those particular indices. Um, and that means, of course, that the fundamental frequency is somewhere beyond this 220 here. And then we did the blending based on the key cycles only. So here is the, um, the timbre blending example we'll do. Uh, three things. Each will be a chromatic scale with one instrument blended into another, and we're simply doing the interpolation on the B-spline coefficients of the 18 key cycles for each of those. All right, thank you for listening. Some kind of adaptive node selection method, like uh, chebyshev polynomials can be viewed as Lagrange polynomials, but with nodes selected in a way that minimizes the error. So I wonder if, have you thought about maybe selecting nodes that are uh, not equally spaced? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll answer the second question first. Um, that's all in progress, and it's definitely a good idea. There are papers. Um, uh, for instance, using uh, you can you can do um, <coughs> uh, interpolation point removal uh, using things like uh, curvature estimation, and this is all this is already being done in the literature for other mostly graphics. But that that's definitely a good idea. The one thing you lose there is regularity. So um, if you're trying to do mixing like these other audio examples that I just played of the blending, you probably want to have the two models be consistent in order to blend them nicely. Um, so there are, there are pluses and minuses, but it's definitely a good idea, and that's definitely in progress. Um, as far as the first question goes, what, we're what I'm talking about here are spline functions on, on let's say, the example, example the 30 sub-intervals, right? So uh, equally spaced intervals. So every interval has a cubic spline on it, right? Um, that, the, so we, we represent those in terms of, of bases for the entire vector space of splines. And that's what the B-splines do, that's what the truncated power functions do. Um, you could also represent them in terms of other polynomial bases, but that would be representing like each cubic as, as a cubic Chebyshev uh, polynomial. And, and right, and, do, and doing all of that, you could do that, but it turns out that uh, the B-splines are just sort of the clear winner on, from so many perspectives computationally. Um, but you could, you could go in and, and represent each cubic polynomial however you want, really, if there's some other reason to do that. But for, for now, the beast lines are the sort of the go-to method. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Thank you for this fascinating presentation. Um, just more a comment. Um, it, could it be, um, is it possible that from this framework to also develop some kind of bands uh, in the sense I was talking about? Because this one, can of course, be seen as bad from, for example, French horn to flute and so on. So once you define starting and ending points, maybe it could be also like other intermediate possibilities. And the other thing is that, um, and you think you also some kind of visual interface for this kind of signal, because we might not only uh, choose, a, a, as I said, starting and ending point, but also some intermediate point to pass through. In the blend, in the blend, you mean the intermediate points in the blend? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Interface where you can yeah. The, yeah, so I did some uh, examples of that for the SMC talk, where we were using the 33 dimensional space and then going through the, um, that according to um, a, 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 a cellular automata acting on those coefficients. So it was using all 33 and meandering its way around. Yeah. But that, and also the interface, I definitely wanted to do that. Um, <clears throat> a lot of to do's. Yeah. Can I? I hope I didn't ignore the said one more question that we need. Yeah. Maybe it's, uh, uh, well, my question is, why did you choose cycles to make the, the interpolations? Like, why can't, can't we just to, uh, make equally spaced chunks? Yeah, absolutely. The good question, or a good point. Um, when I start with the basic model, if we break the signal up into arbitrary chunks, doesn't matter, right? Any, any length, any chunks at all. And now you could do a spline model of each chunk. Maybe you choose different spline models, different parameters, and so on. Um, you could come up with an equally convincing um, model as the, what I call the basic model. And it doesn't really doesn't matter because it's still producing the same sort of almost continuous representation, or, or is continuous, but it's producing a very similar um, final signal. But if you try to do cycle interpolation, or if you try to do any kind of interpolation between cycles, then it turns out that these kind of uh, musical sounds, like um, you know, instrument sounds, that's kind of possible. I hope maybe you were convinced by the, the last demo that it sort of works, right? And with a very, very small uh, fraction, around 3% of the original data. But that's not going to work for, for general signals. But I have, it's definitely on the to-do list to do what you're saying, um, but maybe do it from a, a machine learning point of view, where we can now look at a target a spline model for an audio signal, and then um, learn to uh, to hit that target like it's being done already with uh, audio signals, but maybe the spline model would be a, a, a lighter weight uh, target. Yeah. I think that's going to be it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I, I lost the recording option, and I want to make sure that we are recording. In the case of Matt, I asked him to send me a, a to record himself again and, and to send it. Meanwhile, let me talk about that. I have all the recordings of all the talks, and I have them on a, on a, a memory <laughs> stick. So what I'm thinking of doing is to upload them to my own uh, video channel of, of YouTube. Is All that right. a good idea? Yeah, yeah. Is, is everyone fine with that? Yeah, it's very good. And I, I can give you the option we can make it private or, or we can uh, make it public as, as you oh, wish. Sure. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as long as we're talking about that, I'm just going to jump in. It should be um, down here. Right? I host a musical festival and stuff. I'm just background. And I, we've done it so many years, and no one ever takes pictures. And so we're done, and none of us are thinking about that. We're all thinking about the music, and we're not taking pictures. 
for this conference, I was sitting over there, and the first day I took a picture of one of the slides, and suddenly I was like, <gasps> I should be taking pictures. So I've been taking pictures continuously throughout this. If you have as well, I'm not the person to do this, although I can figure it out, but if you let me figure it out, it's going to take a year or two years before I get to it, I guarantee. But I know people use Google Drive and stuff like that. If anyone wants to like, like create that thing, I will at least get my pictures together and throw them up there. You can throw your pictures up there, too, and we can get like a, a, anyone who needs pictures from the conference. That would be and We can put in the next... Uh, uh, what page of the society? I mean, Absolutely, and people can see all the fascinating interactions. But anyway, so um, if anyone who is so technologically inclined, which maybe someone here is, um, anyway, we could do that. But I also have videos of the museum session. Uh, yeah. okay. okay, now we are going to listen to Jim Lindstrom, who came from Finland and uh, who worked together with Antti Laksonen. And he will be presenting two talks. The first one is going to be on the memory usage of the SIA algorithm family for symbolic music pattern discovery. Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm going to give you two talks in a row. So bear with me with my bad English for you, but let's start. Okay, so uh, Actually, in, in the, you can see that they were given in the, in the reverse order in, in the, in the, uh, uh, beforehand, but I wanted to change the uh, order because this first one is going to be as a basis for the second one. So it's much more easier for you to understand what is going on going this way. And this is a collaboration with my colleague Antti Laksan from the University of Helsinki. And yeah, you can see the outline for my talk. So first I'm going to give you some introduction. Then I'm going to uh, show you what kind of representation we are using. So I'm going to give you the, the common music not notation and the points of representation uh, that is uh, on par with that common music net notation. Then I'm going to define what is the ma maximal translatable pattern. And then we are trying to find these maximal translatable patterns using the original SIA or SIA algorithm for finding them. And then I'm going to show you how we can do that more efficiently using another algorithm for finding those NTPs. Then I'm going to define what is a translationally equivalent class. And again, I'm going to give you an original SIA family algorithm that is called SIATEC for find, finding those texts. And then I'm going to give you a new algorithm for finding the context. And then I'm going to show you how these new algorithms actually uh, perform with the real music data. And then I'm going to sketch some future work. Okay. Introduction first. So repeating pattern discovery is a very elementary problem in many MIR cases, so music information retrieval cases. So it doesn't bear only interest in itself, but it's also used as a pre-processing phase for several kind of algorithms, several kind of problems. And here we are dealing with symbolically encoded polyphonic music and with transposition and time shifting variances. And in our case, the pattern, they may be uh, hidden across voices, so you can't use, for instance, that was used some 20 years ago, so string matching techniques, because they are hidden across the voices, or maybe in polyphonic uh, texture. So we need some kind of special representation in order to be able to deal with all these things here. Uh, actually, this all started some 20 years ago. I was having my postdoc here in London, in. Uh, with Dave Meredith and uh, Gerard Wittins, and we came up with this SIA algorithm family and uh, developed an algorithm for finding those NTPs and texts. And now we wanted to revisit with Antti these original algorithms because there hasn't been any improvements either in the time, time uh, complexity or the space complexity. And we wanted to revisit whether there is a possibility for improvement. And it turned out that actually it's very hard to improve the time complexity, 
but we could do something with the space complexity. And th this is the point of this paper here. So the original SIA and SciTech algorithms, they work in, uh, in the squared space. And now we are going to see that only linear space is enough for them to work. And this is a snippet from somewhere. Does anybody recognize where this come, comes from? So it's from Subes Winterreise, Rust. And you can see that uh, the point set representation or geometric representation, if you like. So in this geometric representation, every single node is represented by point P in this canvas. And the uh, horizontal axis gives you the time, and the vertical axis gives you the pits. So for instance, if you look at that node there, you have a point there, and it gives you both the time and the pits. And if we have two points within the data set that is denoted by D here, and you can find a vector that is denoted by V here, such that using that V, one point is translated to another point. We say that this vector V is a translation vector. And actually, if you decompose the translation vector, the X part of that, or the horizontal part <coughs> of that translation vector gives you the time shift, and the uh, vertical part of that gives, to, gives you the transposition. And actually what we are going to do, we are not going to use these points at all, but we are going, going to use these translation vectors. And because we are using those translation vectors, we are going to get the time shift invariance and the translation in, uh, uh, transposition invariance for free. And together this time shift and translation, transposition, we call translation. So we have a translation invariance here. Okay, what is a maximal translatable pattern or MTP? So MTP is the set where you have a translation vector and the data set. And this, this set includes all the points that can be translated within that set using a given translation vector. That gives you the MTP. And now if you go back and Remember what I was going to do. I was going to find the repeating patterns. Now I'm going to find the maximal repeating patterns. And these MTBs are going to give me those maximal repeating patterns. So for instance, here you can see that we have a set of four points. And now we can go through of the MTBs. There are four of the MTBs. So for instance, the first one, if you look, I saw it actually from here. It says that starting from point three, four, so three, four, this point here, if you use the translation vector of one minus two, so we use one and minus two, we are going to get to another point. So it finds its part, I say. Again, here we have two points, so two, one, which is this one here. If you use the translation vector here, one, three, so one and three, okay, there is a point. And the second one is four, two, so four, two, this one here, and the translation vector was one, three, there's a point. So we know that these two points can be translated by using the translation vector, therefore we have a maximum translatable pattern there. And now the thing is that we just have I have to find these maximum translatable patterns efficiently. So this is the original SIA algorithm that was written by Dave Meredith, uh, Jan Wiggins and myself in 2002. And the idea how it works, I'm going to explain that. But for the SIA algorithm, it uh, took n squared log n time and it took and squared space. And the idea of the, how it works, it goes like this. So remember, we are dealing with the translation vectors. So we calculate all the possible translation vectors. So starting from point one, the 
points are given in a lexicographic order. You start from the point one, you calculate the translation vector to the point two. Then you have the first translation vector. Then the next one is from point one to point three. There's a next translation vector, and you go on like this. You end up having n squared translation vectors. Then you just sort them. This can be sorted in lexicographic order again. And once you have sorted them, you just have to go through the list of all the possible translation vectors and count the multiplicity of, of the translation vectors. So you know, if there is a translation vector that is used many times, they are going to be in the consecutive places in this list. And you just count that multiplicity, and you are done. So n squared translation vectors, you saw them, you have an n squared log n time complexity, and you need the n squared uh, space because you have calculated all the n squared translation vectors. Simple. <laughs> you are done. But as I told you, it's, it seems that it's hard to improve the time running time, time complexity. But now I'm going to show how to cope with the less space. So this is the basis of our new algorithms. You can find the details in the paper, but I am going to see the, uh, show you the idea. Now, if you think it again, so I told you, when you are calculating the translation vectors, you start from the point one, you calculate the translation vector to point two, and so on. And now, starting from one point, you cannot have the same translation vectors more than once, because you are Proceeding, you have every single time you have a different translation vector. So, at most, you have, can use one translation vector at most for n minus one time. So, starting from one, point one to point two, then from the same translation, trace, translation vector from point two to point three, and so on. They can be the same, and that, that is the worst case for us. So, you have n minus one times the same translation vectors. So, that the magnitude for n, one MTP is, is at most n minus one. Another observation here is that actually you can mm -hmm. you can lock the starting points. So if you lock the starting point, for instance, the, the first starting point, and you calculate the start, uh, translation vectors from this point, and you uh, form an increasing sequence of translation vectors. So from the first one to the second one, if you go from the first one to the third one, it's a bigger in this lexicographic order than the previous one was. And actually, if you go through the whole space like this, you have one increasing sequence of translation vectors starting from, from point one. Then you have another increasing sequence of translation vectors starting point, from point two. And you can go on like this. So you have n minus one increasing sequences of translation vectors. Now, what we can do, and actually, we can borrow the idea that we had with Esko Ukkonen and Meli Mäkkönen almost 20 years ago in a different problem, that actually we don't calculate the translation vectors beforehand. We cal calculate it on, on the go. We have those increasing sequences. We fed these n minus 1 increasing sequences in a priority queue or heap so that in the priority queue, we have only one point from all the increasing sequences at a time. And we take out from the heap the minimum one. And once we take the minimum out of, of the heap, we fetch a new element from that sequence where that minimum one came from. And we calculate that only that point, not beforehand. So we have to calculate n minus one uh, translation vectors that we have to be calculated at, at, at any time. So we don't need any more than n minus 1 or n o n space. And we take out from the heap the minimum ones. Once again, they are coming in an increasing order. If there's a multiplicity of some uh, translation vectors, they are coming uh, next to each other. So we can just calculate them. And we have the uh, cardinality for a translation vector and use only open space. Good. Then we go on to translationally equivalent classes. 
salt X. So we say that two patterns, A and B, they are translationally equivalent. If and only if there is a uh, translation vector V that gives you, uh, applying this translation vector to all points in A, you give, uh, you get the uh, set B. In that case, A and B, they are translationally equivalent. And of course, the translational equivalence class contains all those patterns that are translationally equivalent. And with uh, Dave, and, Dave and Gerrit, we give, gave an algorithm that we call Sciatec, and this solves the problem, this translational equivalent class is finding problem in n cubed time and in n squared space. Actually, what it does, if you remember, in this SIA algorithm, we just ordered all the translation vectors, so well, we have had a list of translation vectors, we just rearrange in a certain way that list, and we get an n cubed time complexity. And again, we have the translation vectors, we have O n squared of them, so we have an O n squared space complexity. Okay, so we looked at this problem again, and in again, we, we couldn't find any improvement for the uh, running time, for the time complexity, but actually there is a trick that can be used in order to find them in a less space. And again, we are using another algorithm that we brought in 2003 with S. Kuken and Veli Mackinen, we call that P1 problem. And it's a uh, point set pattern matching problem. So we can find a given uh, point set pattern, we can find its occurrences in the data set in, in o n, on O n n time and in O n plus n space. So once you have found all the MTBs, you just deal as, um, you take an MTB and consider as a pattern to be searched for in the data set. And we have a very efficient algorithm. So we have O n MTPs. You just multiply them with the original time complexity. So you end up having, now the pattern is, so we had M there, that is the length of the pattern. Now the patterns are of O n length. So you have O n uh, cubed time complexity, but only O n space here is O n plus m comes to O n plus n, which is O n. The only problem here is that the original algorithm actually, uh, it guaranteed that for a single uh, tick, you report it only once. And if you directly apply this algorithm, you are going to report the, the ticks as many times as there are uh, they appear in the data set. But actually you can take care of that problem as well. We are going, we are giving the details in the paper you can find. So we are only reporting every single attack only once as the Sciatec did. Okay, how does that work in, in practice? So the original SIA algorithm is very good because the operation it uses, they are very simple and are very fast to, to, to uh, in, in practice. Now we have to apply the heap structure so we have some more complex things going on there. So it's a bit slower in the beginning. But as you can see, this is the in the horizontal axis you have the number of nodes and in the vertical axis you have the time in seconds. You can see that the original SI algorithm is faster first, but at some point of time it's going to run out of memory, which is happening in here. And once it runs out of the memory, it starts to stopping, which is very slow. And starting from that point it's, it's going to be a disaster. Whereas of this new algorithm just runs quite smoothly. So in this experiment, you can see that we had 40,000 number of nodes and it took some 240 seconds to find all the 
MTPs in this case. Okay, then some words of future work. So the algorithms here that I presented, all the algorithms can also solve the sorting X plus Y problem, which is a very widely known problem and it's conjectured not to be solvable faster than O n squared log n time. And if you remember, we have this O n squared log n time complexity with our algorithms. Does it say that we have a uh, sorting X plus Y time problem? No, it doesn't. It does, just says that the way we are solving it, we can solve that way also the sorting X plus Y problem. And after, actually, if you go through the, these problems in that class, you can see that it's, there's no simple reduction pros from those problems to our problem. So I would say that our problem is not sorting X plus Y hard. But still, it's, it's very interesting to know in what way we could get rid of that log n factor. I, I really can't see any, any possibility to have that uh, space complexity and not having any kind of sorting involved. I, I really can't see any, any, any sol solution doing that that way. So, but yet the question is, do we really need that sorting or not? Another possible direction for our future work is to, is to rearrange somehow the algorithms so that they can be uh, used, they can be, uh, the problems can be solved by using kind of some kind of parallel algorithms. There are certain aspects already in our algorithms that can be parallel, parallelized, but I would say that the most efficient ways would, would be to uh, start from the scratch and, and thinking, keeping in mind from the first point of that, that we are going to have parallelism and, and the, that way to find the most efficient algorithm for parallel solution. And these are the two papers that I was citing here. You can find the citations. In, the paper, in our paper, if you would like to have a look at them. So, I think I'm done here. So, do I have questions? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what's the range of uh, your vector? It's 0 to 12, right? No, it can be anything. It can be anything. Yeah, it's not yeah. a fixed range. Or, no, no. Okay, I was about to suggest counting sort. Yeah, but no. I wasn't sure if uh, yeah. the range was arbitrary or not. But then I say it is not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yeah. <clears throat> it was also like 20 years ago when a colleague of mine, Andreas Neske, was working on, on precisely the same question. Uh, then we were calculating we call them melodic patches, and then he was calculating the complexity by looking into the simplicity complexes and looking for the homology groups as a measure of how, how these things <coughs> But there is a funny story. He was running this algorithm on uh, the S and Fox song collection, and one day he told me, there is a song, it takes three weeks, and I have to stop it with it. And then it turns out, he didn't know which song. Then, when we stopped the program, it was ya da 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 da. It was eight times this, yum bum bum, and then the whole thing was repeated again. And I, my question is, how long how long would your uh, the, the enhanced algorithm take to for that song? For that song, <laughs> you have to send to me that song. We, we can have. Ah, yeah, I send. Yeah, yeah. 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 But it could also have been the homology thing, which took so long. I'm, I'm yeah, really and sure. back 20 years ago, the, the buses were much, much more slower. So mm -hmm. the same, we had the same problem with, with 20 years ago in, in the city of university with Dave. So they made the implementations and, and actually we couldn't apply it to, to any, any reasonable data set. So we had to have some kind of, you know, artificial data sets in order to, to find out that, that it, it really works. But nowadays we have much more uh, computational power, so we can do it. Uh, so, 
So have you think about uh, detecting almost with a new pattern? Sorry? Have you think about uh, detecting, because CR, um, when you detect your maximal uh, reading pattern, so the vector V has to be the same. So, um, so I don't know, in a, in a point set representation, have you think about, uh, you know, detecting like, uh, I don't know, uh, almost repeating pattern when you have, uh, so when the vector V is not always the same when it's uh, translated, you know what I mean? Okay, so they may deviate a bit. Yeah, a bit. Yeah. 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 So one, actually, that is something that I was going to tell you about in, in, the, in the second presentation. But you can use different kind of representations. For instance, for the pitch, you can yeah, have sure. the absolute pitch, or you can have a morphetic pitch, or just uh, sure, yeah. you know, different kind of representation. And that, that way, you can have this approximation as well. Or actually, now that you think of, so we are calculating the translation vectors. If some, some, some point is just a bit out of time, so you can find it. You just delete that, actually. But still, you are finding an um, MTB, but that one point, it's not part of that MTB. So it's different from, for instance, the string matching methods. You have to delete and you have to pay, pay for the delete. And then you have some kind of threshold, and if you go below that threshold, it's not an occurrence anymore. But here it's still an occurrence, although this one point is not part, because it's just, sli sli just slightly out of time. Yeah, so, uh, can I continue? Yeah. So for example, if you want to apply this to performances, you know, when you have, uh, when, the, it's not, when the vector V will not always be the same because of uh, because it's performances, so it will not work, right? Sorry, I didn't get that. No. So let's say you have a performance in a, on a, I don't know, someone plays a piece. Yeah. So the the, the time will not be uh, quantified. Yeah. yeah. So do you I, have an idea? Of how to yeah. Do? So using this algorithm, you cannot find that. Yeah. But actually, we have another. I'm going to give you a taxonomy of, of, of related problems. And they we have something that is called the time warping invariance. So they can be out of time, it doesn't matter. So it's a strong invariance you are needing there, but still you can find those occurrences. But once you are applying a stronger invariance, you are going to find much more false positives as well. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. But yeah. you can cope with one, that. One more, one more yeah. and then we'll go to the second one. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm wondering, um, you know, thinking of thinking of the time complexity, right? Because that's sort of like the the holy grail, I guess. Um, mm. It's it's not immediately clear to me why the sorting is lexicographical, you know, um, when we're concerned is in the end with, um, you know, oh, it seems like a lot of the, the processing um, in the actual algorithm is, is sort of com, com, uh, looking at the magnitudes of these vectors and sort of going through those in order and grouping those. Um, so I was wondering what lexicographical ordering does for us that, you know, sorting by um, you know, point distance away from, you know, a fixed point doesn't, doesn't necessarily do for us. Just... But you still, you are still talking about sorting. If you're talking about sorting, you have that log logarithmic factor there. It doesn't matter what sorting you are doing. Yes, but, but... Uh, Unless guess... you have bucket sorting, but in order to have bucket sorting, you have to have fixed points, but we don't have, we, we are dealing with arbitrary points. I guess, I guess a secondary question, I guess similar to that was, I guess the n squared login is happening because you're sorting the vectors yeah. that you've created. Yeah, so I was, I'm just curious, you know, like if there's been thought about pre-processing and sorting the points themselves um, to get n login, and then that could you know, potentially have a lot of structure that helps the algorithm run in n login. Yeah. Actually, we do a pre-processing. We sort the points first and do pre-processing, and we have the n, n log n time complexity. And because we have sorted them beforehand, we are going to have those increasing sequences of those translation vectors. If you are not sorted, they are not in increasing order, and you cannot uh, apply the apply the, the heap structure. I see. So in the new algorithm, you do do that pre-processing yeah. in n log n, but yeah. you still get n squared log n for the runtime? Yes, because we are using the, the heap structure. I see. And the, the heap structure, structure takes log n time. OK. Applying every single step. Thanks a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you. I get to introduce.
introduce our next speaker, <laughs> uh, Shale Lindstrom. Oh, uh, <laughs> and um, he's going to be giving another talk here on transposition and time scaling invariant algorithms for detecting repeated patterns in polyphonic music. Hi all. Good morning. <laughs> and let me start by apologizing my bad English, so you are going to cope me with another 30 minutes. <laughs> okay. So this is once again a collaboration with Antti Laakson and now, and here we have also our new PhD student Otto Björklund in board. So now we are dealing with transposition and, and uh, time shift invariance, but we are also apply time scaling invariance to find these repeated patterns in polyphonic music. Outline. So short introduction. I'm going to give you an example why this is important to have this time scale invariance. I'm going to show you a taxonomy of related works. And then I'm going to uh, define what is a maximal time scale translatable pattern, so MPTP for short. And actually this is quite a hard problem that ha hasn't been solved before. And in order to understand what is going on there, we first created a brute force algorithm and then another algorithm that is more efficient. But still, the time complexity is going to be quite huge. So in order to apply this in real world applications, we have to somehow filter the patterns in order to get it run in, in uh, real world data sets. Then I'm going to show you some running experiment and sketch some future work or possible direction for future work for this kind of algorithm. Again, so repeating pattern discovery is an elementary problem of music information retrieval. We are going to deal with symbolically encoded polyphonic music, and the patterns may occur across the voices. And now the invariances that we are going to apply are the transposition and time shift that we had before. But now we are going to have also time scaling invariance combined with the previous ones. So an example case for this. Does anybody recognize this one? So Johann Sebastian Bach's uh, mass in B minor. So the part is called Credo. And actually, the theme is played first time at the very beginning of, of this part. So, credo idonum levum, and so on. And now, if you go further, we are in the bar 33 to 38. You can see that actually this theme is. Sorry. It's sung by, by Sopran, first Sopran there. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the second shot from there, by alto there, not with tenor here, but in, in the twice duration with bases here. And you can see that they are exactly the same, the first sopran and the bass, but the bass is just doubled, there, the durations. Whereas the second sopran and an alto part, there are slight deviations. You can see that this note here is slightly out, and that point there, and some point of, of the alto, I can't see it here pretty clearly, but it's slightly out. So if we are dealing with the exact pitches, we cannot find those occurrences. Or actually, we can, as, as I told you, we just omit the points that are not, not exactly correct. But then, if you omit one point, it's not going to be in the, in the MTP or MTTB in this case. But if you use different kind of representation, maybe morphetic bits could capture these ones as well, or some other bit representation. Okay. So here is the taxonomy of relative problems. So actually, there are three problem classes. The first one is the exact pattern matching problem. So you are given a pattern 
and you have to find exact uh, matches for that pattern. So every single point in the given pattern, it has to find its partner in the data set. The second class is partial pattern matching problem. So once again, you are given a pattern. And then some of the points in the pattern, they doesn't have to find these matches in the database, but most of the, of the uh, nodes should find its partner in the data set. And then we have the repeated pattern discovery problem. So we are given a data set and you try to find the maximal translatable patterns or here maximal time scale translatable patterns within that data set. And now you can see that within these problem classes, actually, you can apply different kind of invariances, and they are ordered here in the strength, strength of the invariance. In the plain cases, sorry, in the plain cases here, so plain, plain, and plain, you have only the time shift and time uh, transposition invariance as we had in, in the previous presentation, whereas if you have a time scaled invariance as well as we are going to have here, it's a still stronger invariance and therefore you are also getting more uh, false positive matches and the strongest invariance that have been considered is this time warped invariance I was talking slightly mentioning in, in the previous question and answer part. And now that is quite nice here, there's one box that is empty. So there was no solution for the problem that I'm going to present here beforehand. So we are filling the gap in this taxonomy. Another quite nice uh, symmetry here that you can find is that actually the plane and the time warped cases, they seem to be have the same time complexity also here. And one thing that is quite surprising, I told you that they are in the order of increasing, uh, in the order of the strength of the uh, invariance that is required. But still, the problem in the, in the middle, so the time scale problem, seems to be harder than the time warped case. And actually, we have an explanation for that, but I'm going to skip that detail. If somebody's interested, you can come and ask me, I can tell you why, it's, why, why that's the case. And if you look like that, you can see that here, okay, there seems to be a gap. We have n squared, m squared, log n time complexity here, whereas the, here we have only n, m, log n. And we re realized this when we made this taxonomy, that okay, there's a gap. So we have to improve that algorithm, and that actually we did. So we just submitted a paper, and now we have better uh, time complexities for these two cases now. And once again, we almost have the symmetry, M versus log M, but close enough. But now what I'm going to show you is that we are going to have an O N to the fourth log N time complexity for this gap to be filled. So here is an example. So what we are going to try to find is to find maximal time scale translatable patterns. So given a set of five points here, there's an example, but let me just define first what is the MTTP. So in this case, you not you don't have just the translation vector, but you have all, also the time scaling factor. So this alpha denotes the time scaling factor and V is the, the translation vector that we have also in the previous presentation. And now the MTTP is formed by the points in the data set D that can be translated by using the translation vector V and by applying that time scale factor alpha. So the same way that we had in the previous presentation, but now we have the time scaling factor as well. So let us consider one of the MTTPs that can be found in this set. And now you know that notice also that having this stronger invariance, we are going to find much more 
of these MPTDs as well. So let us consider this guy here. So it says that we have an MPTP if we apply the time scale factor 2 and translation vector 0, 1, starting from point, points 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 1. So if we, maybe I saw it, it's better to show here. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it says that starting from 1, 1, okay, we go to 1, 1, which is this guy here. And we apply time scale factor 2. So time scale factor goes horizontally. So 1 times 2 is 2. We go here. And then we have the translation vector uh, 0, 1. So, so 0 proceeding to in the horizontal axis, but 1 up. And we have this guy here. Okay, that can be translated and time scaled using those factors. Then we have 2, 2 which is this one, this one here. Again, time scaling factor 2, so 2 times 2 is 4, we go here, and then the translation vector of 0, 1, we go here, yes, there is a point. And for the third one, it's 3, 1, so 3, 1, the trans, uh, time scaling factor 2, 3 times 2 is 6, we go here, and then 0, 1, translation vector, yes, there is a guy. So we have an MT, MTTP 1122231. So now we have to find an algorithm that finds all these MTTPs simply. Okay, in order to understand what is going on here, I'm going to, going to give you first a brute force algorithm. So if you consider the previous problem, we had only the translation vectors. So we needed only two points in order to say what is the translation vector. The translation vector goes from one point, one point to, to another one. But now we have also the time scaling. If we have just two points, we don't know what is the time scaling. Or actually it's one. But we can have any kind of time scaling here. So in order to set up the time scaling as well, we need four points. So two points to start with and two points to go. And then just we know what is the time scale that is applied. So we have to go through all these possibilities. So we first select these four points. And if you select four points and go all the combinations through, you already have n to the fourth time complexity. And then you have just have the subspaces that you have to go through. So you can't go below n to the fourth. That is the lower limit. Now that you have set up the time scaling as well, then you have to go through every single point in that data set to find whether a point has a partner using that time scaling. So you go within that subspace, you first select some point that is not used, still, still not used, and then you have to go and look whether that time scaling factor and that translation vector can be applied in order to find another point within that data set. And finding that another point takes log n time. So we have n to the fourth and then n log n on top of that. So we have n to the fifth log n time algorithm for this brute force. But it turns out we can do better. But now we have to cast the problem to a different space. Okay, now we have the transpositions. So the transpositions have to be the same within an MTTP. So we form canvases. For a transposition I, we have a canvas CI. So for, for instance here, we have a canvas CI so we know that all the points that are here are actually coming from a transposition I. Coming from a transposition, it means that within the transposition we already have to have two points, but those two points in this space are represented by a single point. So every single point in this space uh, gives you a pair of points in the original space. 
And how how does how do you read this representation? You read it in that way that even for instance this, this point here, which is one, two, it tells you that in the original space we have two points, the first of which is at onset time one, and the second one is at onset time two. And they are uh, they have uh, they are separated by this bit i because they are in this canvas. So you have as many canvases as you have possible transpositions to go through. And what you look at these spaces. So once again, these are onset times. This is onset time and this is onset time. So if you have something that is time scaled, they have to appear in the same line in this space. So we cast the original problem to a problem where you look at these canvases and try to find lines that have the maximum number of points within that line. And to do, to calculate what is the maximum number of, of uh, points in a line, you once again, you have to go through all the possibilities here. So starting from here to here, you calculate the slope between two spot, those two points, then from here to here, here the slope of between two, those two points, and you have a sequence of slopes that you order, and if you order, once again, you can cal calculate the multiplicity of a single slope in, in that sequence. And then you have your MTTP for that canvas. And then you go through all the canvases. So what we have here, if we denote by T, K, the number of points in a single canvas, you saw them, you saw the pair of pairs of them. So you have K squared pairs, sorting them takes K squared log K time. And the no total number of all the points in all the canvases is O n squared. And if you nest them, you have n to the fourth log n time complexity. We have n to the fifth in the previous, now we have n to the fourth. But still, it's quite much. And they are so much that if you really want to have a big database and go through and find all the repetitions, you find it impossible. You have to have some kind of filtering methods in order to cut down the number of, of false positive matches. And we have three different heuristics here that have, we have been applied. One is looking at the inter onset intervals. So what is the maximum allowed in this onset intervals between two consecutive, consecutive points within the pattern? So if something is such that the first note is in the first bar and the second note is in the 16th bar or something like that, that is ridiculous. It doesn't have any musical meaning. So we, we cut, cut down the search space by using this maximum threshold. And once again, you are going to have a very st strong invariance here. You are going to generate much of false positives, especially very the um, patterns that are very small, so just two or three nodes. Mm -hmm. There's no idea to go look at, through all of those, but we, cut, we have a minimum threshold. So for instance, you have to have at least six nodes or something like that in the pattern. And there is no point of applying scaling factor one, because we just had in, in the previous presentation, we had much, much more faster algorithm that goes through this scaling factor one. So let us apply that first and get rid of all the scaling factors one in this case. Much more clever. So here is an example that we run on a database containing 2,500 nodes. And here we limit it by the IOI or in the onset intervals. So we have the uh, maximum threshold for the consecutive, consecutive nodes. And now it was limited by considering the fixed the beat that we had. And in the blue line, you can see that if we have 
two times the pigs per beat as the minimum threshold for these 200 or 500 uh, nodes, we had something like 20 seconds, the running time. Whereas if, if you have four times the pigs per beat, it was already 35 seconds, and for eight times pigs per beat, it was all already 70 seconds. So you can cope with small databases if you have some kind of heuristics involved to, to find those repeating patterns. So some possible directions for the future work. Once again, do we really need the sorting? So we know that you can't go below end to the fourth, but once again, do we need the log n factor there? I don't know. At least it seems quite hard if we want to use that that space that we are using, not not uh, in, not letting let use uh, bigger space. Another observation that we all actually we had quite similar one in the previous presentation that we have here O n squared pairs, but actually only O n of them are distinct. So maybe this is something that we can work on to get a better running time. I'm not sure. So this is the bibliography for the for the taxonomy that I presented. All this can be, or actually not all. This one is the one that is has, just has been submitted, but all the other ones can be found in the paper. So. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Any questions? If you don't throw out uh, the longer ones, with one is here and the next seven by 60, one gets a similar uh, thing as we had with the canons, with the inner and the outer rhythm. So if something appears quite often, then you find repeating patterns which are, so to say, the the anchor nodes for this repetition. Did you did you do anything also with this, so to say, redundancy in the in the data? Did Actually, if I get get it right, so uh, what you can do here. So we are now finding the MTTPs. So in the previous presentation, I, I was or presentation. I was also talk, talking about those texts. So these translational equivalent, equivalent classes. So we can do that again. So we can have these maximal translatable patterns in, every, every, uh, in, in places, and then you can connect them by using their specs. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can capture what you are looking for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it would work for the augmentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for those two uh, presentations. Um, so I just wondering something. So on uh, your slide number ten, you know, I'm not sure I understood uh, uh, exactly the the ah, numbers in the slide. Yeah, number ten. Like yeah, the one more. Yeah, just this, this, this one. So 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 you have all your reading pattern, and you are looking of your um, uh, uh, I don't know the name time scale pattern, right? And so, is it equivalent to, to, to so your, your figure on the, on the right, is it equivalent to plot all your vector v and to look at the line? Yeah. It, okay, it's the same? Okay. So, yeah. It's, it's so, we have taken care already of, of the translation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Translation yeah. Vector. Now, we are just trying to find whether it has the common time scaling. Yeah, okay, so it's equivalent to, to look at the, the vector which are um, uh, proportional, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, I get it. Okay. Questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
está, pero sorry, I'm going to check the, the audio. If the audio is working. Is there a change in the audio? Oh, let me announce oh, that. Okay. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, the, uh, uh, Brian Martinez from Chile, uh, from, uh, from Murcia, who, who is also way, it was presenting the recent video from, the, from uh, Valencia, the Polytechnical University there. Uh, Brian could not come because he got COVID <laughs> just a um, yeah, few days before, and he was going to do the, the two presentations. And so he, we had to cancel those presentations, but the, the two uh, articles are in the, are in the, the proceedings. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. So today we will end early because we, we are going to uh, yeah. we are, we are going to do everything now beforehand. So right now I'm going to present this Arten Pozo, who works together with Paco Gomez, the PhD student at the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, uh, the, the Technical University of Madrid. And they are also going to give two presentations. First, the uh, a mathematical model of tonal function with voice leading, and then the second presentation after the coffee break will be a mathematical model of tonal function with modulation. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marian. Um, my audio is not working, so it's, it's working in my computer only. Uh, yes, you have to yes, yes. change it in your in the setup. Am, Do you know how to change it? OK, okay. you, you I did yesterday. recording. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's only getting from the computer, maybe Matt. Did you, did you check the audio settings? Mm Okay. 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 Okay.
why this is working, suddenly it becomes a little bit more complex and now it's evident that we don't know how it works because we have these two augmented triads that are resolving to a minor chord and we don't know if it's working. It becomes even worse when the tonal centers are the same but transposed. I mean, when we have two lithium uh, scales that can be disposed as chords and suddenly the criteria for using dissonance is not an option because dissonance is the same in F lithium and B lithium, right? So we are not working at all. The problem gets even bigger when we go to just future and we use slash score harmony. So we are completely, you know, all our previous knowledge about just harmony and classical it starts to uh, get, you know, fuzzy. So we are like in fear, right? So what we are going to propose here is a model that solves all the cases uh, for just progression, uh, classical music, and other styles, right? So it's based on an algorithm called the Hungarian algorithm. It's, it's a algorithm that uh, well, well it finds, finds the minimum voice leading in between two structures. So about the methodology of the, of the model, okay, I don't like beautiful mathematical models that are not going to serve me as a musician, okay? So it would be a great mathematical model, but then I go to the staff, I put the first course, and then what? Okay, that's the point of the talk. So I have a chord, and then What's next? I can copy other musicians, copy John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, Ravel, but I'm copying, okay? But I don't have a method that I know how harmony is working. And this is even worse when I try to mix different styles. I mean, I use uh, classical material and then try to mix it with jazz material so I becomes even harder, you know. So the ma also the, it becomes harder when you have to write for sections of instruments. Okay. So about the reward, the first statement is that the model must be valid for all timbre. This is not in the talk, but I have the proof. Okay, if anyone wants to check it out, can ask me later. Okay. Then the model must be valid for all timing systems. That's okay, not only restricted to Western music. Also, the model has to be able to explain music in the classical way, jazz, and other styles. And also, and this, has, this is a very important point, the model must be adapted to human perception. So metrics in the model must be adapted to what we hear can use random metrics and you know see how it works so I have to be sure that all metrics are the right ones for human perception right okay and also the model must resolve all possible cases which are that now okay so the Hungarian algorithm um, has these steps it was invented by Kuhn but in the talk, I'm going to be restricted to step one, two, and three because the steps four and five are for very complex cases, and I'm I will run out of time if I go into that. Okay? How this works? Okay. So I have two chords here. The link, it's the E link. It's a progression. So I have the classes there, and. It's uh, C major and E flat major, right? So I have those chords, and I want to know two things. The first thing is how they voice lead, if there's only one way to voice lead them, 
if there are various ways to voice lead them. Okay. And the second thing that I want to know badly as a musician is if C is resolving to E flat. Because I don't know it. Okay. You don't know it. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, okay. First I'm going to create a, an L matrix called Dick matrix, which takes the minimum class distance in between classes, right? Do you see the minimum class distance? Okay. So then I go through the algorithm and I subtract the minimum of each row to the same row. So I get to LF matrix, okay? This matrix. This is the first step. And then as I have one zero in each row and column, okay, I have reached the solution. That's what the algorithm tells us, okay? So when you have one zero in each row and column single, you have reached the solution. Maybe you can have two solutions, okay? You always have a solution, always, okay? So then when I have um, calculated L, uh, F uh, matrix, okay? I look at the positions of the zeros. So this zero is in position one, two. This zero is in position two, three, and this zero is in position three, one. All right. So how I read the solution in the algorithm? Okay. So I pick up the first voice that goes to the second voice. Then I pick up the second voice that goes to the third voice, and then I pick up the third voice that goes to the first voice of the second. Voice. Okay, so this is the algorithm when the chords have the same dimension. I'm talking about dimension as cardinality in the same terms, mm -hmm. okay? Because I talk about dimension of voicings in the real vector space of an arbitrary dimension, and I talk about dimension of chords as the number of classes of the chord. Okay, just to make the, that clear. All right. Okay, so once I have reached the solution. Maybe I have to use the zero method for some cases because I have found that we have many solutions. I mean that voice leading can be can be um, can can be done in various ways, maintaining the minimum amount of the um, distances in between the voices. The minimum, so I have various minimums and various ways. Okay, and then when I have that. What I'm going to do is understand how the voices are moving in the minimum. And that's how I calculate the tonal function. Okay? So, if the, in the minimum, not in voicings specifically, specifically, in the minimum the voices are going down, then the function is going to be dominant. Okay? If they are going up, the function is going to be subdominant. And if I move one voice and the rest stay, the function is going to be tonic. This is for the standard um, understanding, understanding of functions, okay? But there are a little bit more, okay? And other cases that doesn't sound very musical, but they exist, okay? So, sorry. What I'm going to do is just only don't be afraid of this formula, okay? What it does is to take an L matrix as, as is calculated in the first example, okay? And it transform it uh, into a cadence matrix. That is the matrix that transforms uh, a given voicing into another, maintaining the perception to the minimum value, okay? So this is the global formula, and then when I have uh, that matrix, what I'm going to do is to calculate the characteristic polynomial of that matrix, okay? The CE matrix, cadence matrix. And then I only have to do one last step, that is to know where the roots of the polynomial are. If the roots are in one side of the 
Mercedes secret group. I have one function, and if it's in other side, I have another. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is the explanation. Okay, so I have roots of that polynomial on one side, it's one function. Say uh, in the sorry on the um, stabilizer I have another, and the, if the roots of the polynomial are on the left side of the um, stabilizer, the function is going to be done. Okay. So these are the seven types: positive, definite endomorphism, with all the classification depending on where are the roots of the polynomial, okay? Only the possibilities, okay, of the, of the roots. So there is no need to go ahead with this. And this is the general classification of tonal functions. Tonal functions can be dual or it can be normal depending on the solutions of the Hungarian algorithm that provides as a new idea, uh, sorry, a new idea of having dual tonal functions. Not only a chord moving to another being in dominant function, but the new idea is that it can be um, having the one chord to another and having a dominant function, and also at the same time having subdominant function. Okay, for some cases, <laughs> depending on the dimensions of the um, chords uh, x and y. It can be non-parametric or parametric, okay? And depending on the um, position of the roots, it can be polarized if all the roots are on one side or non-polarized, okay? Everybody is following? No? Not so easy. <laughs> Not so <laughs> easy. It would be nice to have examples. Okay, I'm going to the example and, and you are going to see it, okay? Is there an honest tree of the non-polarized? There's no no classification? Yeah, the non-polarized mm -hmm. is when you have one root in one side and other root in other side of the stabilizer of the group, which value is one, okay? Mm -hmm. And that has have a classification, but for example, in the modal interchange, you are not going to find any case. Non-polarized um, tonal functions are those ones that doesn't voice lead because one um, one voice is getting up at, at the same one voice is getting down so the brain is like confused okay so you don't have like that, that direction okay so you can uh, classify but in music is not very often used yeah, I should hold up the questions yeah. okay <laughs> it's not questions yet sorry <laughs> I know you have questions. <laughs> okay, I'm here for your questions. <laughs> okay, let me uh, carry on. Let, let me. Okay. So this is a global formula only for mathematicians. Okay, but here's the the formula that um, has all the process taking two chords x and y. Okay, seen obviously a subsets of the set of classes and then um, reaching the, the polynomial. Maybe the polynomial can be a complex polynomial. It's not uh, very usual, but it can be. So for completeness, I have, put, I have uh, written C, okay? For complex polynomials, okay. Mm -hmm. I have another example here. I'm going to do the same thing. I, I uh, want to know, okay, if G resolves to C. So I go. I create the L matrix. I apply uh, the first step of the algorithm. Now I have my zeros. Okay. I read the position of the zeros, and then I transform it to a transformation matrix. Okay, the cadence matrix. The cadence matrix is going to transform the voicing C X to the voicing C E. So it's this matrix here. Okay, transforming. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one voicing into another with the minimum perception. That's the condition, okay? So finally, I reach the polynomial and I have the tonal function here. The tonal function is the curve here, okay? Mm -hmm. 
okay? And the factors are going to tell me if this is going to resolve to, to the next chord or not. So I have my factors on the left side, so the function is dominant, okay? Okay, now let's get a little bit <laughs> uh, into the difficult cases. So when there's a problem when chords have not the same dimension, so how do I fix that? Okay. So by, by using, it, the, the, this is in, in the paper, right? But by using uh, improper integrals, we have found that the distance in, in between silence uh, touted as the zero class and any note is infinite, okay? So we have to fix, fix that into the algorithm defining this convention, the infinite arithmetic convention, to make the voice leading work. Okay? You have questions about this? You are thinking about this? So, so an example. So you should be thinking about this. Okay, so I have another case. Trying to know <laughs> if C7 is going, what function it has uh, when I eliminate a voice. So this is like in real music. Mm -hmm. I mean, in jazz music, in classical music, there's always changing dimensional, uh, the, the number of voices are always changing. So I have to uh, check that case too, right? Mm -hmm. So I apply the infinite arithmetic convention into the uh, L matrix and I follow the Hungarian algorithm. I keep doing my uh, my operations into the matrix, okay? Then I transform the matrix the same way using the transformation to reach, reach finally the transformation matrix that transforms the one voicing of the chord X into another voicing of the chord Y, maintaining the perception to the minimum value, okay? So, um, then I calculate it, uh, it uh, characteristic polynomial, so it is one, okay? Doing the product of the factors. Keep on going. Okay. And finally, I reach the tonal function, which is the polynomial, okay? So the last step I have to do now is to know, sorry, to know uh, where are the, the factors. Okay, so I'm going to use a graphic. Is the tonal function? The tonal function is the the curve in red, in in green, sorry. And the stabilizer is there, and the factors are one is staying on the stabilizer, and the other one is on the right on the left side. Okay, so the function is tonic. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. So then uh, I'm going to work, you know, I'm going to test these cases if they work with the criteria. So in the first talk, I'm only going to go for analysis and then I'm going to go to create music using the functions mm -hmm. in the second talk. Okay? So I'm going to use only analysis. This is called a timeless place. Mm -hmm. You probably know this too here in America. And this is an arrangement I made for strings. So then I'm going to use the tonal function theory to analyze the tonal functions of the piece. So retain this in your mind. You can take a photo. <laughs> it has copyright. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> and then I'm going to go to the um, this is the analysis, okay, of the chords and the tonal functions with T tonic and D dominant, and I have some special cases there for you. Uh, sorry. Okay, is is that sounding right for you? The volume is too hard. It's too loud. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm the, not the uh, icon with the speaker. Yeah, thank you. Let's see, let's see if we can hear it. So check if it works. 
songs for you chord by chord, right? When the strings start to go through the arrangement. analysis right so we are moving in tonic calculating all the tonal functions and then I have like conflict zones so if I'm you know like uh, analyzing this okay imagine that I give this uh, sheet of uh, music to you and then I told you okay uh, analyze this all right so I have these problems here and this, these are these cases, right? This, this one going E minus 7 go to C minus 7, and C minus 7 going to, going to uh, E minus 7. So it can be you know, confusing to analyze. And I use the method. So in the first case, using all the steps that I have explained before, I know that it's dominant. And in the other case, it's dominant too, because voices are moving down. Okay? All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wait. Okay. Go ahead. Have there any questions? Is that what it's Well, I, the first question is. Um, when you talk about tonal functions, normally you just pick a scale and say, okay, we are in C major, and then you say that the other chords are C major is tonic, major is C yes. dominant. So here, it's kind of you say that the tonal function is more like a transition between yeah. two chords, so why? I mean, yes, because um, this is a root on jazz analysis, okay, so when you Think about it in classical music, maybe tonal centers have, what, what do you say, that in, in uh, some chords have like fixed, fixed uh, tonal functions. But that's like the first step, because, because when you start to compose, then you have to open up your palette for composing, and you get into ton, uh, modal interchange and other techniques in jazz, and suddenly um, you only have to to look to the transition. So you have to define the tonal function in between the transition of chords. Because, for example, in John Coltrane music, you are um, modulating each, maybe each bar. Mm -hmm. And does that hold with the old way of understanding? If you, if you want it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, I mean, because it's based on constant and dissonance. Okay. And then you cannot define a tonal function for. Uh, I mean, it's not in a uh, defining a tonal function based on consonants and this. I mean, it may work for for uh, classical music, but I mean, does that hold for if you take this definition of tonal yes. function? Does that hold for? Yes, yes, yes. Music, yes. It, 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 in the cases yes, we have, we have in the cases we have explored that are large, you know, like. Yeah, it's an extension on top of the other, but it's not based on consonants. And we should think like, okay, C to F, C major to F major. You say that this is subdominant because we think of C as the. No, as in the, the case there, there are the like point. some there are like some tricky cases here that are going to blow your mind. 
no? Because mm -hmm. suddenly you think like maybe the five has a has, um, dominant function, but in, in three voices is not true. Okay? So you mean from C to G? Yeah. Yeah, so you have to there, but then you hear it and you have to re relearn music, right? Relearn, yes. <laughs> <laughs> The justification of the idea to call the the direction dominant or, or yes. dominant and not the chord itself, there is a justification. I remember Nicholas Hayes argues that even Rameau was thinking in that way. Yes. But yet, Rameau would be thinking on the fundamental base. And there is a distinction between triads and seventh chords about the relation when we go down in a triad, the the um, the fundament goes up while in uh, seventh chords, if we go down, the fundament goes down. And this distinction I don't see. Are, are, are you duplicating bass lines? You are doubling, right? In your example. And no, I just, they, they are just uh, virtual. They are not in the, they don't need, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not speaking about the real bass. I mean, in what, what, what I mean, if, if, if I have um, G7 going to C, Max seven, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, major seven, okay. In those cases, voices are going down. Right. That's mm -hmm. the, the the thing. Mm -hmm. If you start to double class classes in your matrix, voice leading is going to uh, work in another way. You know. Yes, yes, yes. So you have to deal with double place classes. Sorry, as one class that has the double of amplitude when it's played, okay? So that's another kind of topic. I, I, you know, I don't manage the, okay? No, no, no. I don't manage it. <laughs> no, I, I, I had a curiosity. I mean, you are, you are a musician uh, uh, first, uh, so you... Yes. The, the, <laughs> this is your way to uh, answer to uh, questions you have of when you analyze music and you are not satisfied with the that traditional is, methods? Or? That's one one way, but the other way is like I have played music all my life, so suddenly it's like I have, uh, how do you say, saturated? Is that? <laughs> saturated all the options uh, of harmonic composition. Yeah. So, so you want to open? Yes, so suddenly I was, okay, 251 now, okay, uh, I use this modulation here that I heard in DBC music, and suddenly I, I wanted to explore further mm -hmm. and to kind of kind of um, do my do my stuff, you know, uh, create my my compositions, but knowing what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's how I think it would be nice to have. A, uh, so you show an, ex an example that you have. I made my analytical examples, you know, giant steps. Like could train, for example, what, what, what if it survives this? Yeah, yes, well. it survives this because of the interpol. <laughs> there's an interpolation in the second part of giant steps. You first have the cycle going in one direction, right? The cycle of major steps. Yeah. So that works using movements that I'm going to show you in the second talk. Right. Okay. So, so we just yeah. wait. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, it never. I just uh, and, and then it, when, when it goes in in the other direction, okay. You have to kind of justify it by a Phrygian modal interchange. But it works. Because Colton is tricky, you know? It's going in one direction for the A part and then going to the B when the two fives start and suddenly you have that. But it, the model survives it. Okay? <laughs> I'll be super quick with this question because there are so many questions. But I think we saw before that G7, sharp 9, sharp 5, no 1, um, it is actually classified not as a dominant, but in this model as a subdominant. And maybe yes. if you have plans to extend the model so that it can handle these alterations when you have these notes coming from. Not I, I played. I played um, the example, and uh, also it might be confusing for getting. You know, for example, in jazz, I'm going to refer just like quite a bit. Uh, we tend to generalize that we have our seven. A dominant chord, and then we can like add tensions to it, and it's going to work, you know. And sometimes it doesn't work. For example, alter chord, for me, it doesn't work 
with major uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. So that's why I um, make that example, and um, suddenly uh, it, it doesn't resolve, you know. But maybe I have you know to look it again because. So it, it, it is open quite of you know to review some things, but in general it works. Okay. I was going to make the comment um, in regards to say C major okay, as simple as possible on a C major triad. When you were talking about you know we I, I when I'm teaching theory and I'm, I might open a can of worms here, so I apologize. <laughs> I'm, I'm not presenting and I'm not going to defend my point of view. Um, but. Um, I show students a lot of times that, you know, labeling chords, you're in C major and you have C, E, and G as the notes, and you label it as the one chord, it doesn't always function in a tonic way as the tonic chord. So your idea of transitioning, in, as a composer speaking from that degree, and even as a theorist, everything is always contextual. So it makes sense. You can't isolate just one group of notes and say, oh, that must be this. It depends on where it came from and where it's going. So in that way, this makes absolute sense for that. That's okay. Why throw that Thank you. <laughs> there, there was also the point that you can have bifurcations, no? Subdominant. Sure, sure. You have a subdominant function in one voice and the awesome. subdominant. This has also historical sources in Hermann Erz, uh, early 20th century, yes. and also then Harrison. Uh, so you could even take their examples and see whether your attributions coincide with theirs. Okay, so this I discovered this because I didn't know, you know, I didn't expect of having dual functions. You know, I expect that, that you know, I, I was going to understand music arc, okay, okay, this has dominant function, uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. but there are dual functions because of the solutions of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, for example, okay, when you modulate to the triton, okay, you are in C major, and, and suddenly you want to go to uh, G flat major. Okay, so in that case, I have calculated that, and you have dual functions, so you can, you know, be be in C major for a time and then go to G flat major and return, you know, without uh, more tonal centers. Isn't just the resolution of the dominant sevens uh, in that sense, F goes down to E and leading tone goes up, isn't that a dual function? No. No. No, no, no. It's, it's a, when, when you have uh, multiple solutions into the matrix. So you have multiple polynomials and one polynomial has the roots on one side of the stabilizer of the root, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you have another solution yeah. where the, the roots, roots are on the other side. On the other side. Thank you. Yeah, we, we have time and, and also there is a second part, but you and, and, okay. and you and, and we can go to the coffee break. Okay. Oh, were you pointing at me? Oh, yeah, I was trying to point out. Your oh, oh, I thought you yeah. two had that question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll, so I, have a, I have a very broad question and a more mathematical question. doesn't matter which one goes first. Do you have a preference? No, no, no. Absolutely no. Okay. Um, I'll do the broad question first, um, or just pack them together. Um, what is tonality? And then why should I believe you that it's innumerable, and not only innumerable, but finite? So that if I don't use one of the... I have the number, I wrote it down. Uh, 16 million, 216 tonal functions, that is something that's not, I guess, tonal? No, you are, you are missing one point. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's a, one thing that is tonality. Tonality has to be expressed, okay, just, I'm going to answer first about tonality, sure. and then I'm going to answer about the number. Okay, so, but there are two different concepts. First tonality, uh, has to be thought as a um, set, right? But as a set in time, okay? because it doesn't make sense to don't use time in the model. Mm -hmm. So tonality can be defined as a progression, you know, a progression of chords with classes, where all the classes of the progression are strictly contained into a half 
of the circle of pins. That's the definition for tonality in the classical way. I mean, all the classes that are sounding in a period of time in the progression are strictly contained into a lydian tonal center, a major tonal center, or mixolydian, or whatever you can you want to call it, because all the, all of those sets are uh, equivalent, okay, in circle. That's the first uh, answer. And the second answer is what this number is. Why is this number? Okay, so you have it's very easy calculus. Uh, some mathematician over there uh, did it yesterday. So the calculus is first, you have to calculate all the number of chords. So how many chords do you have? Okay, so you have 12 classes. So the number of chords is um, 4096. It's the, power, the cardinal of the power set of all classes. Okay, that's the first number of chords. So as tonal functions behave quite of, sorry mathematicians, uh, behave quite a bit as binary operations, okay, so I take two things and I have a polynomial, so as this works like this way, I only have to take the square of 4096, that is that uh, large number, 16 million. It would work for microtonal music as well. Yes, right. yes, because... Yeah. So maybe you need to take off the empty set, right? <laughs> empty set. <laughs> what are yeah, the empty set? Yes. <laughs> so you just need to do two minus one before. Yes. Okay. Yes. To call it a call. No. Well, it's, it's, it's a stupid quick Yeah, you can. Uh, if you can, if you want to add it, you have to fix that. And yeah, you know. I don't understand your, the first answer because you say we have all the. So let's say mixed Lydian tonality or Lydian tonality. Yes. And then you say they are equivalent as diatonic sets, no? Wait, wait. okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm a bass player, right? So I'm going to answer that from the perspective of the lowest note. Mm -hmm. So in, in, how do you say, in set theory, they are the same classes. Right. Mixed Lydian right. are the same, you know, as. Mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 Lydian, Lydian, okay, but depending on what I'm doing as a bass player, uh -huh. the harmonics are going to range force uh, differently. You know, I have my bass with all the harmonics, and then I have some classes going on, maybe played by a saxophone player or a piano or whatever, some classes. Um, hoping there is no um, intervals of flat nine in between, but that's a stylistic restriction. And then my bass is going, you know, to range force some uh, harmonics differently depending on the note I'm playing. So that's what uh, is the difference in between hearing a Lydian sound or hearing a Mixolydian sound or a Brillian sound. But the classes are the same for both sets. It's not your question. No, no, no. My question is, <laughs> it's the same set. But it's not the same tonal center. Yes. Except no, 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 no. It's the same tonal center. But when you arrange it, when you arrange it, okay, depending on what voicing you pick up, you are going to get a different color, a mode. I mean, okay. But but strictly speaking, into mathematical terms of set theory, are the same sets. And this is tonality. I mean, the, 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 what's your answer to what tonality was? Yes. And therefore, is tonality the root of the mode, or is it the set? The no, no, tonality is the progression. Yeah. It's the progression. Yeah. Okay, so I, I can be having, for example, I am going to give you an example. I play some so what voicings. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what? So what voicings? Playing. And then I play D. Okay, so I in Dorian, but I play G and I'm in Mixolydian. Nothing has changed, so the tonality is kind of the same thing, but we have different modes. Okay. Want to speak? <laughs> I, I might be confused about what, how you're defining tonality, but it seems like various restrictive. If you're saying that you have to restrict your roots to half of the circle of sets? To a half, to a classical, I mean, when, when you are talking about 
tonality in the classical classical way. Why yeah. couldn't we not take this for modulation? I talked to our piano technician about the piano. What did he say? Um, he said he would try. He said he understood. He, he said he said I. It was, that was two days oh, ago. He, 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 I know. I don't know. I, I, I said he's busy. Oh, I said, he won, and I, 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 I have no hurry. As you're playing it, it doesn't bother my sensibility. Except for the. But it's interesting that you would point out the, the different timbres across the octave there, and I like, and I said. I said the person playing yeah, the piano. I said sure he, he showed me, and I said and I can hear it. I can, I can. It's easy to hear. And I said so. As the piano technician, I just want to let you know that. And he wrote back, and he said I will. I will really try to answer that. So whether he does or doesn't, I don't know. But, but he, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. So I know he's going to try. But, yeah, we'll but he's aware of it. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. No problem. No problem. What were your thoughts about the piano? Um, are you talking about the C sharp you were discussing? Yeah, or I was talking about an F sharp. An F sharp? Okay. That, that was continuous. Okay. In long, the long time. In the piano? In the session. Okay. 
because last night I had to leave. I'm go I was going to listen to that. I pointed it out to the, the guy in the halls, um, and I told him about it. So, uh, but last night everyone was talking and still building. So we couldn't really do it. But this afternoon I'm going to go over there. We're going to see what we can find out. So, again, I can't promise anything, but we're going to try. We're going to see what we can see. What was the place you pointed out to the piano technician? Oh, but Amelia was pointing out that on the piano itself, um, first of all, there are some tuning issues, but what was most fascinating to me was the fact that around like C, between C5 and C6, or between C7, C7, there were some short ranges, like even like a fifth, that the timbre of say A flat, the A flat there, was far deader than say the timbre of the D below it. And so it was. It was a weird change in timbre that was quite obvious. I see. If you play evenly, what one note after another one, they should. Sound oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but if you play evenly, one or other note sounds more because <laughs> the timbre is gone high. You have to put voice voice the hammer, the hammer, so get a softer sound. It's I see. Too, too harsh. I see. Harsh. Yeah. I see. That's easy. Hopefully, the technician could do it. If not yeah, well. yeah, yeah. But, but that was really fascinating because I, again, I, I'm not trying to, because I care about sound very much, but as a jazz, typically jazz and playing that kind of thing, I'm always fascinated. Like, if a piano is slightly out of tune, I kind of like it. Yes, yeah. Because it's kind of it's like colorful. It's like, okay, that's kind of nice. You know? yeah. So, they so. Don't tune, they don't tune the, I, I'm <laughs> aware, yeah. On purpose. Right. Uh, of the three chords, they confuse them a little bit. Yeah. So they are not even. Yeah. Or just and, then, and then I've played stretch tuned pianos versus not, I've even played pianos that were non stretch tuned. You know, yeah. it's an interesting kind of thing. But yeah. it also comes from the pianos yeah, I've played in just at the beginning. I didn't. <laughs> they were upper piano. They were not. Oh. Oh. And the, the sound of the upper pianos in the places where they used to play, where nobody paid any attention to yeah, right, right, right. tune it properly, it got the sound. And it, 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 that's where they are, they are recordings by, by this famous pianist, uh, Jack. Okay. Uh, I I'll give you a whole bunch, but. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the. Give me a year. Uh, yeah, I cannot. Uh, <laughs> You remember his name now? Art Tatum? Yeah, that's Okay. <laughs> that was my first guess, Art Tatum. Yeah, right. This is the first recording. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can see the, the piano in the opera. Yeah. And many years afterward, uh, this famous uh, Canadian pianist. Bill uh, No, the other one. Uh, oh, uh, is it Keith Jarrett? No, no, no. Right. He's Canadian. The big, uh, that guy, uh, Oscar Peterson. Oscar Peterson. This is a fantastic yeah. piano. Fantastic yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And also with the other famous, uh, in, in older than him, they played in, in two, two concert bands by Dusseldorfers. Oh, okay. And they were chatting, but they, they never thought they could play jazz in, in this. Big elephants, they say. Ah. And it sounded quite good. You know, <laughs> good. The, the other pianist uh, uh, had a band. Uh, you probably know. You can. No? The other one? <laughs> uh, um, Black, it was Black. Yeah. I mean, we have a few, but like Count Basie. That one. Okay. Count Basie. <laughs> Count Basie and yeah. Oscar Peterson. Mm -hmm. I yeah. didn't know they did that. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. All right, okay. Fantastic. Okay, yeah. And uh, Oscar Peterson, you see, uh, uh, the, the, what's the name you talking about? The other one? Or Tatum. Uh, or, no, no. Uh, uh, Count Basie. Count Basie yeah. plays very a few notes. Yeah, he's very sparse. Yes, he's very sparse. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 very sparse. And Oscar Peterson makes a, a full round trip around it. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Art Tatum is one of my is one of my absolute favorite piano players. I just I, I I I've had transcriptions of things that he did and stuff like that, and it is just 
he was almost completely blind too. And it's just, it's just, he can stretch a tenth in his left hand, and just even when he's doing stride, no, like that. And, and the chords he's hitting up here, the spacings, and it's just, it's like, oh my gosh, how do you do that? It's amazing, it's amazing. Most people don't like him because he can't play the Count Basie spar style, Art Tatum is all the time, everywhere, every line, just, yeah, just this, this crazy, just stuff, nonstop. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 But they are fantastic. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Duke Ellington is known as a band leader. Oh, I, 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 but as a piano player, I love how he plays. He is such a stylist. Oh, I just yes. love how he plays. Yeah. I thought that the piano last night sounded. I know it's difficult to describe sound, but it's only thin. Thin? Thin. Mm -hmm. not, not full like a music voice. Ah! I don't know. Mm -hmm. For the piece, actually, the, the, I have to, to be very uh, low because the, the soprano was just in front of the piano. Mm -hmm. So if I play more, mm -hmm. I yeah. over. Over the company, very And the piece is very most of the time. It is the song itself. It is this kind of a love song. Few things. I remember it is her father. Her father went away. And then. She sings this artist. I hope I have a key comes to me. Not a plan. But the, the guy had another lady. <laughs> Sad. Sad. For, for a hand. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the, the argument that has to be in order to do the tragedy. <laughs> I want to say this with Tim mm -hmm. here, but come on, that isn't the present situation. Mm -hmm. um, in the Fall University Symphony, the mm -hmm. uh, first day was said that there was like a bar that had come down, and mm -hmm. after a period of time, the mm -hmm. owner had come down to it. And I think they were going to be in the room. They were going to be in the room. They were going to be in the room. I should have thought of this. And then he loosened the middle screen of each three, and then people said it's all okay. Or just he's a pig. Or just. Or for other art music. Very well, but the great disadvantage is dance because we cannot tune it right to the spot. If I, if I only goes out of tune, immediately you can mm -hmm. play. But you can have you seen Mariana? Have I seen her? Yes. What do you mean have I seen her? Yes. Ah, I'm, I'm not a person who does her song with her. With the Frankish style. Okay. Excuse me for a moment. Go ahead.
Hi. Oh, hi, Fred. Hey. How are you? It's very quick. So I just want to take that and to talk to you. But I've enjoyed your papers and things like this in the past. So oh, thanks. Just thanks. <laughs> so thank you for what you do. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been uh, really uh, a lot of fun as a mathematician to work with my musicians. I'm a theorist. That's really the highlight for me. <laughs> well, we're, 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 what happened without uh, my musician friends. <laughs> That's how I got into this, actually. Okay. Okay. Oh, to quote, to put one of my best friends, we're the Mike. My, my friend, his name is Scott Ramsey. He's not a musician, in fact. Although I did teach him how to play guitar, he was a pretty cool songwriter now. But um, but he's he's a wonderful man. He's very humble. And so it's just one of my favorite things that he has a habit of saying things like that about his wife and her and what he knows. I'll still say your students really love you. Well, I'm a wonderful kind of individual. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm like, working with theorists and musicians. We're, we're a dynamic, fascinating group of people. Who wouldn't want to? Yeah, speaking of that, I wanted to ask you about the sonorities that we have the last piece you uh -huh. were playing. Yep. Like the vertical, the vertical dynamics of some uh -huh. of those chords and the way it resonated afterwards. Um, is there a recording of that? Was it, is it going to be posted sometime? It, it will. It will. Okay. Um, I have, I mean, I've played that piece. That's a former student of mine who wrote that piece. Um, and I helped him craft it. And then I've taken a few liberties in, in how to do it. Um, I will say it's 95% him. I, I did very little while on the other end of it. So, but how sonorous that. So I played it. I, I actually did a version where I went into my home studio on my home piano, which isn't wonderful, but recorded it very slow to create my own master recording for what I wanted it to sound like. Um, and then I have. Am I sitting here? No, 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 no. I just want to comment that, that, that jazz is full of these ambiguous chords that you don't name by looking at their function. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and some of them, they blur it. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say it's clear, but when I'm analyzing things, I'm, there's so many notes in there that it's not really obvious what it actually is. And, and sometimes I just, it could be named. I just decide. I'm like, I'm going to call it this right here and move on because that's my name. Is it this eleven or is it that? Probably with these alterations. How did you do that? O sea, que, que hay muchos voices que a veces tienen muchos acordes. Sí, todas las posiciones. Sí, 
I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know what would be it's really interesting? I Let's go ahead and get started. Second time I get to reintroduce I don't know if that qualifies as a re reintroduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, again, Isaac Delgado. Um, continuing along the same lines, he's going to be talking about a mathematical model of tonal function um, involving modulation. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, so this second uh, talk, what we are going to do is to generalize the same concept applied to two chords, but we are going to extend this into tonas, tonalities, tonal centers that are moving into time, right? So, as in the first talk, we have the same problem here. Now we suppose that we know how chords are working from one to another one, okay? So we know that. Because Pat, Brent is <laughs> smiling because he, he, he knows this. And now what, what, what we have to do, okay? So we, we don't know how to create sections into the music because we don't know how to modulate. So there is no uh, uniform theory for modulation. So maybe we are in C major for a while, but then we, we want to modulate to another key center. And uh, what we have to do? OK, we can guess. We can guess, but we guess. And if it sounds good, then we go. OK? But we don't know exactly why. So we are in trouble again. OK, so I'm going to use the same formula as the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> I'm going to do the same, the same thing. But instead of using chords, okay, I'm going to generalize it, generalize it to open tonalities, where an open tonality is a tonality, okay, that is not a half in the circle of fifths. For example, an open tonality is a pentatonic, it's not a half. You cannot draw up. Okay? I'm going to use another example for open tonality, okay. The, the whole tone scale is an open tonality. What you will say? Yes? No? Okay. It is an open tonality. Okay, so I'm going to generalize this for this kind of uh, open tonalities. And then for tonalities too. Here's an open tonality. Yeah. Looks familiar to you, and there is a traditional tonality, 
So the, mm, the set is a hard thing in the circle of fists, okay? You can take photos if you want. Okay, <laughs> so this is clear. So to study how the, the tonal centers are moving, we are going to use the same process, but using a mathematical object that serves us as a calculator of tonal functions. <coughs> so this is like kind of a kind of a magical matrix, okay? This is the matrix. I call the so-called universal link matrix. So from this we can go select a tonal center. The first tonal center is we are going to select some classes here, okay? And then the target tonal center, we want to know if it's resolving or not, we are going to select it in the column of classes. Okay? This is a bigger version. Also, I have these um, uh, signs here that uh, what they symbolize if, is if the voices in the abstract movement if they are moving up or down. So I use, okay, for example, E is moving, up, is moving up to F by one semitone. For example, another example. C is going up to E flat by three semitones. Okay, so this is like the global voltage. For those who are interested in microtonality, you can arrange your own universal matrix and use it uh, with uh, 24 columns and 24, mm -hmm. or if you want, whatever tuning you want to use. Okay? So here is my question. Does C linear modulates to D flat linear? Don't say this. <coughs> Does it modulate or no? You don't know. I'm going to show you. <laughs> Okay, so I, I have selected first the classes that are common, so they have a distance, and then apply the criteria for infinite that I explained before into the matrix. So the classes that are not in the tonal center have uh, the value zero. And when I have a classes, a class and uh, another class that is uh, not in the tonal center, the value for the matrix sorry for the metric is infinite okay as uh, it's covered in the paper so then i go through the hungarian algorithm this is the first step this is the second step and i have uh, just to understand is these columns and the, these letters is this tonal centers or is it no tonal centers okay no first tonal center is See no, but the column, it means the column. Also both, also both sides. Both, both. Tonal centers. Values, what are the values actually? The values here, the minimum class, in the minimum distance in between classes. The distance, okay. 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 Which classes? I mean, it's median classes? No, no, no. In between this class, at this class, the minimum value is five. But are major chords? No, 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 no. classes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Major yeah. in semitones. Okay. I'm, I'm measuring in half tones. Okay. So now I have which the, the solution. So the solution are the zeros in parentheses. So I study the position of the zeros. And then I recover the first matrix. I recover the, the, the metric. And I know that I have one, two, three, four, five voices descending by half uh, by semitone, okay, in from C Lydian to D flat Lydian, and two voices that are static. These ones, these two zeros. So uh, C is going to be preserved, and G is going to be preserved, okay. And then we have the polynomial here, so, and we have to study where the roots are. In this case, it is dominant because I have five roots on the left side of the stabilizer. Okay. 
I'm going to our next example. I'm going through the uh, next example a little bit more quick. Okay? So I'm, I, I have the same question. Uh, does C linear modulus to A uh, flat linear? Okay, so I uh, I select the classes. This is the first step of the algorithm using the the uh, infinite arithmetic convention. Okay. All right, and then I have the solutions. So from C linear to A flat linear, I have three voices that stay the same, which are C, G, and B, and uh, four voices that are moving down. Okay. Any questions here or? So actually, the infinity and the zeros don't mean anything, you just have a, a, five, a six times six matrix, no? Yes, but it, it does mean that the, the distance in between a class that's, that is not in the tonal center, so it's zero class, mm -hmm. and another class that is not in the tonal center, so it's zero class, using the integral, the integral of the same, uh, under the same point is zero. So. That's why the, the, the you know, mm -hmm. for the purposes of the algorithm, you're right. Mm -hmm. just, yes, but, you but, just need uh, to but also, look at those. Uh, but details. also uh, for the definition, uh, using the definition of the of uh, an integral. Okay. So we have the here's the polynomial. Okay. But uh, what was the function? Here the function is the same. It's dominant also. Because I have uh, four voices moving down and eight voices, the rest, staying on the stabilizer. Okay? So we have the same classification as in the previous talk, generalized to tonal centers. And now we are going to use this because it could be, you know, a, a great mathematical model, but if it doesn't work, so. We are in trouble again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the first method is like kind of classical method. Uh, we are going to use uh, pivot chords, sorry, pivot chords in between two tonalities. These are my nodes for the graph. So I have in uh, for the standard. Um, uh, just chords uh, of each tonality, okay, C major, F major, B flat major, E flat major, and so on. So this is for the, the same case, but for an open tonality, in this case is the minor melodic scale, so I have the same, the same notes. And now I have calculated all the um, tonal functions, okay? I have, the, those, I have done this by hand. So the blue line means tonic. One, one, one voice is moving in the minimum or is moving uh, to one side or the other side of the stabilizer. When I have an arrow, this means that the function is uh, dominant. Okay? So from this chord to this chord, the function is dominant. But if you invert the order, you get that from this chord to this chord, the function is subdominant. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this is something that is the result uh, of studying the mathematics. Okay? So, and then, this I want to make a point out of this because it's very important to notice that sometimes we have two, you know, a double arrow. In this case, this means that the algorithm has two solutions. So we have dual tonal function. Okay, this is kind of new because in music theory we don't uh, think about dual tonal functions. So, for example, going from in C major, right, from E to F, okay, E minor seven to F max seven, we have dual tonal functions. So we can move from one chord to the other with no issues in perception. Okay, right. So. Have two tonal centers <laughs> that 
uh, I know that they uh, have dual tonal function in between them. Yeah. Okay. S lithium has dual tonal function when it's resolving to G lithium. Okay. This is result is not in the tab, but I, I have it in my bag. So if anyone wants to check it, ask me. Okay. And then I, I, I'm going to to find um, a path from one tonal center and then use the pivot chord and then go to the other, you know, to compose whatever. This is one method. But I have a more exotic method that is kind of what I like, you know? I like risk. So I'm not going to, to be like using like classical kind of composing methods because I love classical music, but I'm not a classical musician. So I want kind of kind of risk here. So I'm going to play with dimensions. So I'm going to increase dimensions. I'm going to use first uh, chords in four dimensional spaces, and then I'm going to add the bass line. So I'm going to create the function using one of the 12 available bass notes. So I know that there is always a tonal function that is dominant when I change the bass. I think that I'm going to get a lot of questions about this. So when I first to show you, hope this is not going to explode. <laughs> so you this first um, it was going to explode, right? <laughs> and this is a composition of mine called the El Plaza Jazz Club. It's already closed. Um, what I have done here? Okay, I have used my tonal centers. The first is going up a semitone tonal centers. Okay, so from A Lydia to B Lydia. B flat lydian, and then going uh, with the negative form modulation. So the first, I use one chord per tonal center. So A max seven is in A lydian, okay? B flat major uh, with the bass in C is in B flat lydian, and so on, okay? One chord per tonal center, per bar, okay? So I use my mathematics of modulation and then I modulate to the B part, okay? And then I modulate from here, from G, B, uh, G flat lydian, I modulate to A lydian again. Let's see if I not, I'm not lying, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, we are going to hear the first, uh, the first chorus, and then, as is, um, as is normal, you can talk during the bass solo. <laughs> okay? It is not working. It's working. It's working. It's working. <laughs> Let me... Okay, so this is how the, the music is uh, constructed here. 
I have another example. I'm going to get directly. I know how how I I'm in time. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You have another. You can have till twenty after, because we started ten till. Okay. So now I'm going to use the same thing. But let's check. Let's check the harmony here. Just for a just for a second. Here I have these tricky chords, okay, that are uh, slash chords, you know, complex things. And um, how I have done this, I want to first go to the model and then return and play it from there. I have used my movements that I have calculated using the, the Hungarian algorithm. And I am going to go first, uh, this is the A section, okay? So I go. One, then I go to F Lydian, then I go to B flat Lydian, then return again to E, e flat Lydian, then go again to the same section. And then I jump from E flat Lydian to A flat Lydian. Now I'm in the B section, right? So I start to move. This is dual, so I can move this way. I'm moving following the numbers. Then I go to F Lydian, then I go to B Lydian, and then I modulate from B Lydian to E flat Lydian. I can do this because I know also that I have um, the matrix that uh, gives me this information that B Lydian has, um, it, it resolves to E uh, flat uh, Lydian. Okay? Following the results of the matrix mm -hmm. exclusively. I don't do anything else, okay? All right? I only follow the results of my matrixes. That's what I do. Okay, so I'm going to... Now, how many chords I have from for each tonal center? I have changed this, so I have two chords per tonal center. Two chords, right? So. I have a problem. Nobody told me. What's the problem here? I'm waiting for you. <laughs> if, you if you check whether the harmonic direction of the chords... Right, kind of cut right. So what I have done, increase the dimension. I have first, I, I had... Um, four dimensional voicings, and then by hand, not cal calculating the, the matrices because it's a huge process, mm -hmm. I change the baseline. So when I move from a four dimensional space to a five dimensional space, my chords are connecting because I change the classes in the links. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the tonal centers are also working. So I did this composition, the mathematics, in five minutes. It took me five minutes. And then I improvised the melody uh, on the keyboard. All right. So let's.
That's all. Thank you. All right, do we have questions? Yeah. Well, um, not so much a question, but just something I, I, I wanted to point out, and I, I mentioned earlier. Um, this, this, these two talks, they're, they're, despite the, the beautiful jazz and, and the interesting questions that have arisen about jazz, I, I kind of wanted to point out that this is, these two talks and this method is not just about jazz. This is, this is really, really general. And that's um, just some, something really kind of uh, significant that I wanted to point out. So in particular, um, chords here are in this particular um, space in the sense of the, the um, taxonomy that uh, Jay gave us, uh, OPC space, right? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's significant, especially because of the C. That's that, because that, 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 that's the, the problem child, as, as, as Jay said. So, so what's going on here is really this is, this is a very, very general method for, um, first of all, looking at um, voice leading paths, you know, between two chords in this, in this kind of problematic space, hmm. putting a, a, a metric of sorts on this space, which is already hard, okay, and then, and then uh, using that metric to choose a particular path uh, between two given chords, right? Yeah, yes. that's, mm -hmm. now that's, that's uh, significant in itself. But then it's not just about the distance. Uh, there's extra information that comes along uh, with this method uh, that comes from choosing that particular path. And that extra information is what's providing uh, this notion of you know, tonality and tonal, it's not a tonal function, really, uh, which is uh, a, a, a very, very universal way of um, of, of defining and talking about tonal functions. This is extremely significant. And, and, and now the second talk, as, as I understand it, is, is now um, extending this not just to um, uh, relations between uh, two chords, but relations between two. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's sort of, you know, like, you know, a step up. You know, one, and one could, <laughs> I hate to go this, go here, but one could sort of characterize this sort of categorically in terms of you know, category theory and morphism and all that. I'm not necessarily advocating that, but one could. Yeah. But 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 I, I wanted to just to point out this is this is really really uh, general and, uh, and 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 says a lot more about jazz. It's, these chords don't have to be jazz chords. It, the genre doesn't have to be jazz. Mm -hmm. Any. It's it's all about you know, OPC space. So I, that's enough. Okay. Thank you for your summary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you. Uh, in the graph you put it at the beginning about the graph at the beginning okay. yeah that's it with the arrows and the blue this no this no not the, the no, no, no this, this well the, the previous one, one is the previous the, one yeah. this one so mm -hmm. actually the the blue ones doesn't have any arrow but does that mean that uh, is, is, is arrows kind it's of just some function uh, but it's not path related i mean it's not like a kind of tonic. graph i mean tonic is that reflexive? Is my question. Is that because if you go from let's say two seven to seven diminished, uh, there are tonics. One is tonic of the other, and the other is tonic of the one. Or is isn't that? I, don't know. So, sorry. I, mean, I mean, explain your particular case. Yeah, my particular case is if you have the transition from two seven to seven diminished, yeah. this is tonic. Yeah, right. and the other way, and the other way also the other way so it points yeah. out this part, yeah. like they are both yes. sonic and yeah. one of each other. Because the case, two, two voices uh, stay, and then yet one voice moves, moves, and then if you go the other okay, way okay. around, then it's still so, tonic. Right. Tonic can be reverted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, okay, it's not right. This is much more. Mm -hmm. In time. I also would like to comment on this. Look, the Karl Dahlhaus has written a lot of books, but there is one thing which he creatively really inserted as a new thing and, and this is his distinction between functional difference and functional indifference. So he says third related roots are indifferent and fifth related and step related chords are different, functional different. And, and your graph fully uh, uh, 
Explain. Sorry, who who you said? Calder House. Okay, Calder House. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it must it, it survives. It fully matches what he said. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just what... <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the pointer. Uh, in addition, I, I think everybody sees that the circle of fifths is is dominant, and and, and mm -hmm. that's what we. Yes, expect. here you can, for example, it survives culture, but it sur it survives uh, okay. standard just yes, progressions. Yeah. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, one thing, in that graph, the tonic function okay. is not transitive. So you go from one mm -hmm. major seven to six minor seven, it's yes. tonic. Yes. Then six minor seven to four major, major seven is tonic. Yes. But from one major seven to four no. is dominant. But, but that's, that's logical because when you go, you, you would change to tonic, you have to be moving down uh, to voices probably, and then the the the, the this is simply that the tonic transition is not transitive. No, it is not because uh, uh, you, you may have uh, a tonic transition and you just move one voice, and then you uh, have another transition. Okay. You may be then moving then a different to, voice, okay. and then t okay. you you yeah. fall into so, you know, so dominant yeah. or dominant. That's why, in, uh, for example, in a lot of classical compositions, um, they move like one voice. Mm -hmm stay a little bit in the change and move another voice so the change is not so big as to be sub subdominant mm -hmm. that is what okay uh, i really like the fretless play thank you okay <laughs> thank you too this <laughs> um yeah so i guess if i if i'm looking at the graph and trying to compartmentalize it into you know certain cycles um, you know, for example, what I see is the sort of tonic edges, the blue ones, right? Yes. Um, representing uh, the circle of thirds. What I see is a circle of fourths or fifths if you reverse it, because you go from one to four to, um, to where is it, seven, and so on and so forth. And then you also have just edges going around in sequence from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Um, do you agree with that? Is that is that is that yes? For example, that that particular progression you talk about. Do you know the standard, my romance? I don't know my heads. I'm sorry. Okay, da da da. I'm going to sing. I'm not a singer. Da 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 da. Okay, so it matches the in that case. The first uh, four bars of my romance go in that direction you are pointing out. Mm -hmm. So yes. So one focus you can, you know, use. Sorry, focus. One kind of perspective you can use using this graph is being tonal. I mean tonal. Nobody is going to kill me for saying this. Okay, tonal. Okay, I'm going to use the chords strictly contained in a tonality. I just can uh, search for some cycles and see what it happens verifying the, the arrows. So okay. what, does and, it make sense? Yes, yeah. and just just curious, then then you, you already sort of highlighted them, but then I'm wondering what the double edges represent, the dual. The dual, you're the, wondering. Yes, I would okay. like to work so when, when, you, when you resolve the um, algorithm, maybe the solution of the algorithm, you have more than one zero in okay. each row, okay? So you can find that there is various uh, tonal functions for one link of chords. So you have a, voice, a, a way of voice lead a chord to another in two different ways. And in one way they are ascending and in the other way they are descending. So as I have two solutions, I have to distinguish that from the cases where I have only one solution. So in those cases with two, two solutions, I use the double arrow, okay? Yes, because, so for, for so Maybe what I rephrase it uh, for, for you. So yeah. what, what happened is uh, you reached the minimum okay. and the minimum is realized by two voice leadings. One is going up yes, and one is going down. That's why you have double arrow. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I guess aside aside from all the cycles that I talked about, the circle of 
you know, just ascending, you know, uh, diatonic steps and the circle of thirds and the circle of fourths slash fifths. That's it. What's novel or not included in those graphs is the motion from five, four, and four to three, if I were to put it that way. Yeah, I would say yes. Okay. You're right. Okay. I just want to have a suggestion, maybe, like instead of putting two arrows for the dual, maybe putting two arrows for the tonal, and, uh, sorry, for an tonal. arrow, two arrows, like, like one line with two arrows for tonal, and two arrows for one. tonal, you mean tonic? Yeah, tonic. Sorry. Oh, so, okay, sorry, 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 tonic. And make two arrows, like one going from four to five, and another line going from five to four. I think it should be like point out. The, the thing is that what yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I don't use, I, I'm not going to use your advice, because, <laughs> why, right, because, yes, be, be, but I'm going to explain you why. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> because when I, when I, when I use this line, okay, when I use this line, the tonal function is changed when I'm uh, considering the progression of this, for example, this chord, moving to the two, okay? But if I invert the position of the chord, the tonal function changes. Also, the criteria of classifying it is tonic. Right. That is one move, one, sorry, one voice is moving, okay? But here maybe it's one voice ascending, but from here to this chord is descending. So I don't use that line. But I mean, in, in graph theory, like, here you are kind of mixing a d-graph with a, not a d-graph, and, well, I think it would be, the, the relation is the same, like, okay, one are tonic to the other, and one is to the yes. it's kind of, but the, I mean that I'm making point in two arrows for the four to five and five Maybe, four, yes, okay, 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 like, okay. Two lines, I mean, one okay, two, and the other one, okay. I think it's, okay. it's kind of more, could be taken into consideration <laughs> to use, uh, <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, it will take okay, maybe two arrows. Yeah, two two lines. And no more. more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any, anything else? Yeah. Actually, the second part of your talk gave also an answer to to all the questions which we had in the first part. You yeah. motivated this approach as looking for large form things, but actually, as a, 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 a chord scale theorist, could do analysis now by, by taking the actual chord and also supposing some underlying uh, diatonic correction or whatever hmm. and compare whether whether this is both dominant or maybe also you could compare the different analysis on the on the scalar level and the chord level hmm. so actually it's you, you you would have a concept of tonality if you could do that yeah yes yeah. 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 All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs>
actual gets me no. <laughs> I prefer pity loud, but the only drawback is that sometimes I have to ask twice what you are telling me because maybe I listen music too loud. Okay. Okay, you can imagine my slides right now. And you can see what is going on. Okay, I can try to unplug and plug again. It happened to me once to make a presentation with no slides. No. Because every, no, yes, yes, everything commercial. I was back from the US in 2017. I gave a talk the day after. Um, yes, everything was crushed, just uh, the slide after. I talked without slides. So if something else broke him, so maybe we can do the same stuff. Uh, let me make one more try. And otherwise, we can make it of slides. Okay. I won't touch anything, but if stuff disappears, so we can just talk. So uh, you are a musician, so <laughs> we can sing and uh, say the name of the notes without any troubles. Exactly. <laughs> Precisely. Okay. And let's start without any. Okay. Uh, everybody was yesterday. Uh, today at the presentation, um, at the lab, I saw several faces. Okay, how many of you uh, like uh, would like to um, are able to solve the Rubik's cube? <laughs> oh, wait. Yes. Okay, oh, great! Wow, wonderful! I'm ashamed of still not being able to solve, but please don't tell around. <laughs> not able to solve that. <clears throat> okay. And because I was not even able to solve the Rubik's Cube in three dimensions, now I started working in four dimensions. So at least I have an excuse of not being able to solve because I can't even find a Rubik's Cube in four dimensions. Okay, that is why. Thank you. So this is why. Uh, because we. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> now it's better. Okay, this is why. Um, it was not possible to find um, a new skill in the third dimension, exactly. <laughs> of course, the staff is beha behaving well when they use the guy of the technology. So, of course, things are very like, smart and sensitive. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm sorry, sorry, I forgot to tell you that even my presentation was in four dimensions. This is why you can't see that. <laughs> Everything is printed. <laughs> Uh, we cannot easily visualize because, of course, we need um, once we have. Sorry, I was remembering in 2017 stuff that happened. It happened for me to sing because I had examples. If Thank you. The other is to use the, the other okay. computer. Yeah, oh, yeah, no problem. I just made this, um, some little changes, you know. Mm -hmm. It's also nice to, especially at this time, to have some fun. So otherwise, people start thinking at lunch and talking just for me. Okay, so uh, this is a collaborative work with, you can see, a lot of Japanese name except mine, not that much Japanese, and a bunch of universities facing, so ranging from uh, Palermo, uh, Venice, uh, in Sendai, and nearby Tokyo. Uh, I think that uh, many of you know this, uh, this drawing that I made years ago. Um, and but if we focus on a specific detail, there is the uh, <laughs> yes, exactly something <laughs> I made it so I included what I was more interested at. It took one week to complete this stuff, by the way. Okay, this is the Ruby's Cube where I put the name of the notes. So kind of inspiration came also from you know like Latin squares, magic squares, stuff like that. And so uh, yeah, and that's the Q made in Mathematica. And uh, what's I have here? Okay. Can you put it here? <clears throat> okay, this was a um, quick uh, short excerpt uh, from a video uh, I made with a Japanese colleague, you can die. Uh, it is like everything nice, but it was pretty hard because it was a composed piece which I had titled Hello Cube. And I had to change, I don't know, uh, a big number of times because it, I was composed. I said, okay, now I can rotate to make a heavy effect. And my colleagues engineered told me, no, it's not working. 
Also, finally, what the, the pianist girl had was just my handwriting made like the day before because nothing else was working. But finally, we made the recording. Uh, so, this is quite a famous guy. This is the inventor of the Rubik's Cube. It had no Rubik. Um, according to some journals, some interviews, uh, he got uh, this kind of inspiration to explain some transformational group theory to his students. I don't know what happened to his student, but he uh, became, <laughs> became very famous. At least the cube was good for him. I don't know how, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I also think that uh, many of you in this room know well uh, this place. Uh, <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Is there anybody who never came there? Uh, oh. I must, of course, everybody had to come there. So I think that many of us are here because we weren't uh, class study ski number one. So I'm mentioning that because, uh, yes, one of the first time I started uh, thinking about this project, I was at Yertam and I was following the classes by Moreno Andratton, um, music, the first musical approaches, combinatorics. Actually, that was my first approach to mathematical music theories. And so, Okay, there was combinatorics. That was a pretty fascinating topic. At the same time, uh, on a um, kind of nearby shop in Paris, have you ever been to Paris? A lot of you yeah, went. Yeah. Okay, yes. There was a uh, shop and I bought a Rubik's Cube. Uh, again, I wasn't able to solve, but I thought, okay, maybe we can make some music out of that. And also had found there a 4x4 cube. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, a bit harder than 3 by 3 so yeah, there are plenty of cubes. But there is an advantage when you have the 4x4 four four stuff, because uh, it, it reminds us of classical four-part harmony. Yeah, so then this is why I was following this one. I remember it was like attacking, attaching labels and things. I have somewhere in my house the physical cube. <laughs> so, the original version, the idea, just had, uh, was in this way, so in each phase we have uh, four rows, in each row we have, like, sorry, in each vertical column uh, we can imagine to have a chord, like a nice, like a nice uh, uh, C major chord. So, we have four of them, so we can really classically and Western my this style, think of a cadence, so for example, uh, one, five, four, one, for example. But we have six phases, so <coughs> we can make uh, multiple cadences, also in different styles. So for example, we can have some classical, we can have some jazzy uh, ones. I also put somewhere, some phases, also the gandino, cigado, cadence as well. And uh, this is one of the first small movies we made. So the idea is that we put the notes, but once we rotate the cube, we, uh, we mix up chords and we, we, we mix up chord sequences. Of course, that is not granting that we are getting a nice result. Yeah, it was a um, nice behaving example, uh, but um, in this way, we can mix up style, mix, mix up chords, so that was the, the starting point. Of course, we can choose which notes to put, which is a big choice. We have to choose which movements. Actually, we can start thinking not only mathematical terms, but in musical terms, so we have plenty of questions. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we can borrow the quite large literature on the Rubik's Cube because there is also an entire notation. So we can use the notation of the cube as kind of tablature for the, what I called cube harmony. There was a pretty big uh, model that said about once for one technical reason. Was not easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you could ask yourself and ask me why did I found the big cube. 
There is one simple technical reason. You see, uh, there are the sound modules, like the, the sound for the cards, and the word is more than one, but they were too expensive. So I kind of asked for, and they told me, oh yeah, if you find 1,000, then okay, I don't need 1,000. I just need a few of them. You don't see any stuff here because it was already kind of expensive. So there was like the first prototype, but if you're able to make this sound module smaller, so I will be, so we can start a collaboration. So uh, that's another challenge <laughs> that I can give you. Another more practical, but uh, maybe way, way more expensive was this other prototype, which was the first prototype which I made in collaboration with these guys from the Tohoku University in Japan. They are from a research center, which is not working music. Uh, they are working with, <coughs> sorry, electric communication. And actually, what you can see here, the stuff, they are pretty small uh, motion tracker. And this cube um, was 3D printed for our project to add enough space to embed inside this motion tracker. The platform that you see uh, has um, generates a magnetic field. So this is going on that way. And when the, the, this marker with LC foil without moving, they are disturbing the field. And so the information can be um, retrieved. So we have a, a motion tracker. So the thing we just made is applying their technology to this idea. Once the computer gets, and it's called the IM3D tracking system. So once the computer gets the position of each part of the cube, uh, we can um, map to musical notes and finally we can hear uh, the sounds. Uh, but it's still a uh, unique uh, thing. Um, it's pretty interesting. And uh, what you can see here is the rendition of the cube in virtual reality. So the advantage is that you can rotate and you can also predict what is uh, what's happening. And even if like me and other people you can uh, not still able to solve the cube, but you can just press reset and change. Or you want to change the tuning, no problem. Change the lines of code. Uh, yeah, it's pretty easy. And uh, yeah, that's the group of uh, Professor Yoshifumi Kitamura at the university. And you can see the logo, the antenna here. That uh, was the place where the first antennas were built. Uh, in the picturing up, we were at nine the conference in 2018, uh, conference for new instruments, uh, new interfaces for musical expression. Uh, down, uh, we were in the lab making some trials. And on the left, uh, this guy Pascal, uh, by the way, is also grew up in, in Paris. Uh, he presented his research at SIGGRAPH in 2019. That was the world uh, before pandemic, so everybody was smiling. Okay, uh, to make stuff more complicated, I started to add more dimension. Uh, yesterday we had a very interesting presentation um, regarding, uh, yesterday evening, regarding the hypercube and its role in music theory. Here I'm not uh, going too much into details, I'm just uh, using the general idea, the Tesseract, mm -hmm. and uh, something that I like to use when explaining this idea, of course not to use it more, by the topic, but to students mm -hmm. is using the that famous painting by Salvador Dali because it, I think that's excellent because you know I think even kids know that the development of a cube in a plane is just a cross but the development of a, a tesseract uh, in the 3D space mm -hmm. is, a, is again a cross but made up of eight cubes and uh, yeah, and this, the, the guys that took it over very well, uh, I think just genius. I'm always surprised by this painting. So the thing is that, uh, so I was wondering, okay, but what about creating a tesseract with this cube? Uh, because in this way we have the tesseract, but each cube it is made of its a Rubik's cube. And I found out uh, a quite a recent article by Professor Takashi Yoshino of Toyo University, which is close to Tokyo, who actually developed this model and coding and obtained a working prototype. This is the development where the eight cubes are separated, and each one is a Rubik's cube. 
So we have all the math that we need to, for the Rubik's cube, all symmetries, all translation, sorry, or rotations. But with some added constraints, because of course, if we turn up, um, if, we, if I rotate a face in the 3D cube, of course I'm affecting also the other phases, some other ones. If I rotate one of these cubes, I'm also affecting the nearby cubes. Yeah, and also uh, yesterday at the museum, uh, even the kids were seeing the animation, so they could somehow grasp the information. Uh, <clears throat> of course, there is plenty of complex math behind. The details are described in this quite interesting article. The thing is that, uh, of course, we need the rotation matrices, and we need the rotation matrices for all these things. So, for example, if we just focus on the x, y plane, and we neg neglect all the other information, we just have the familiar cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine, rotation matrix, but also we have, which are the ones? Other two dimensions, because we are in four dimensions, we have x, uh, x, y, z, w, of course. Uh, I'm not, uh, so, um, I think they were pretty late, so I'm not a show, I, I won't show, present you all the rotation matrices, but that's because we are late. And, uh, okay, <clears throat> and that's the musical idea. So, in my first, um, yes, an example I proposed, I was thinking of chords. So, four by four, uh, four uh, a sequence of four chords or four notes, which is pretty classical. But once we change the number of dimensions, <clears throat> we also have to think in musical terms, because we can have more degrees of freedom, or we can have less. So, for example, when we have uh, just a face it, the, the small square, it could be a single note, maybe not too interesting. A cubelet, uh, 3 by 3 by 3 cube, the, this one, so we can make chords, we can make melodies if we just press some notes. And uh, with this one, which would be like the ideal hyper Lewis cube, of course we have many more degrees of freedom. We might have different timbres, we might have different tuning, everything is nice but uh, hard to code. So what I'm going to show you is that uh, I think the most simple application we can do, but nevertheless is some, something you can do. So, uh, so um, the simplest mapping is just assigning a note of a C major scale uh, with the octave. Uh, as the last cube to each one of these cubes. So the, an, an entire of these one cubes is playing just one note. Uh, the color choice is random here, so there is no connection with the data research. Um, of course, we can add more and more information, but uh, you know, already computational, this was a result. The thing is that, uh, yes, and this Paul Takashi, Professor Takashi Yoshino, who kind of collaborated with me in this research. So this is the idea. So for example, we we have X, Y, Z, W. <coughs> we can select here which uh, side we want to rotate. And this is the, the result, for example, one of this rotation. And in music, we have this effect. So we start here with C, D, then you see we have two colors, we have two notes, uh, two notes again, and then we are back. I got an interesting question yesterday, something that I didn't uh, think about yet. So I don't remember who, but somebody asked me, okay, but we have, for example, here we have plenty of yellow, and just one slice, which is white. They asked me, okay, but in, yeah, are we gonna hear more of the yellow sound than the Yes, the rest of this other one, I said no, because we are just taking this note as labels, but maybe it could be an idea for a, a further improvement to also balance, to also have a, an auditory idea of um, the degree of scrambling of the cube as well. And. Uh, <laughs> No, 
So you can wonder, okay, but do we need all this math to make a cross sequence? Of course we don't. But the, the, the inverse way, this is the easiest uh, way maybe to grasp uh, this, this application. And it was already computational, not, uh, as you can see, not trivial. Mm -hmm. And we also made another application which is actually it's not really making a hypercube because uh, it is considering eight separate independent cubes. So we just have eight, eight cubes where we considered um, string sound, but uh, a little bit different, like uh, upper strings, lower section strings, uh, plucked instruments. This is in collaboration with Pascal, and this is the first. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. So maybe my computer is off. Uh, it's no, it's back. Okay, so just to create some, to take you away. Uh, awake. So <laughs> it was the place where I was working uh, last year, but don't tell my bosses that during the, the coffee break I was making videos. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Can you hear? <clears throat> okay. Um, this was the I think the most portable and cheaper application where we have a physical cube to use. Uh, it's possible to, to select the cubes, to, to move and so on. Uh, also, we can make just one rotation, just one of them all together. Of course, as I said, we have eight cube, but it's not really a hypercube because they are not interacting each other. That is our first application. Um, I think we can skip a little bit, but uh, you can find the, the videos, the link to the videos in my article. Uh, I also try to use that within some musical performances, not uh, live performances, you know, because when everything crashes, it's not nice to see the other performance. Okay, sorry, but it's a musical instrument crashing, so can you have a, a coffee break and then we can be back? No good. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. So I just use here these interfaces and um, connecting the, um, the device here and playing. And I use this one to make uh, a recording for a group, that, uh, I don't know if you know the female laptop orchestra. Okay, you can check it out, we have several videos. We are improvising and uh, improv remote improvising from different places of the world. And the, you know, that kind of works when you stay two hours to make the technology work, that you play half hour and again to, to check and edit the recording. Go. And, uh, <clears throat> So I can show you directly from, uh, okay. T was for um, improvisation and soundscape. Yeah, and this, um, yeah, this was my kind of score. And here I had been uh, um, playing and uh, recording uh, one track on top of the other. Uh, everything uh, upon the, the soundscape from Zara. Uh, from Zadar. So I can skip to one part. There was the cube. How was I using the cube? Just as the harmonic basis uh, and improvising upon. Of course, there are some glitches, some things because it's something new. So we have uh, not only to make the music but also to like, shape the instruments. So that's the thing. There was the theremin, there were some images. Uh, and pictures, so okay. This is number six minutes, so you can. I can just show you the final, maybe. So, if you're interested, you can, uh, yeah, you can find this. Okay, uh, I thank you for your attention. This is my first collection of the cube. I think my favorite one is the one because it, it is not possible to turn a soft or a kind of anti-stress cube when everything does not work. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
to have something to create rotation, to have a control. Actually, it turned out to be uh, a bit more stochastic instrument than I wanted it to be. Yeah, this is why I'm uh, some exams using it to harmonic basis. Like, this is the harmony I can get, and then I built up the music upon on that. But uh, I want to be considered that it's truly a stochastic instrument, something that maybe I have to learn how to play. So another, another paradigm, because it's not only a matter to think of the music you make, but uh, or thinking on your instrument, but understanding how to play that. Even uh, Erno Rubik was learning, and also, as he said, he was the first one who was learning how to solve the cube, of course. And uh, things happened. Leon Theremin was uh, the great inventor of the um, of the theremin, that took his name, but of course he, he also had to learn how to do that. Of course, this uh, possibility has less less than theremin, but uh, yeah, I hope to no longer consider this one as a stochastic. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, any other question? Uh, yeah. Uh, when I use your cube for generating it, um, uh -huh. A sequence of chords from random mm -hmm. and loop back to the, mm -hmm. to the first chord. Mm -hmm. Will you be able to do this in 4D? And for the question, how do you choose when you have two different methods to solve the cube? Uh -huh. How do you choose which, which method? The fastest? Oh. Is uh -huh. there any way to choose uh, yeah. through which harmony I would like to go? Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, I should think of that. Um, in general, when we solve the cube, we have a situation, a scrum, yeah. we make changes, and then we get back. So musically, that's a cycle. Yeah. So it is, I think, that to be all the time interesting, even if we make some change thing, we, we obtain very dissonant chords and stuff, I think that it can have a musical interest. Uh, I think that I should also be more into the different solving techniques um, by the way, also in the project we had, and somebody was able to solve, but it was not possible to use right now the speed solving techniques just because the instrument uh, blocked. So, quite easy, it's attack, and it blocked. So, that was a good idea. But that could be interesting uh, also to have yeah. stuff like that. If, but um, if I might use some kind of speed solving technique, could be interesting from a like, mathematical point of view. So like, you see how this technique can sound, but from a musical point of view, I could be more interested in uh, uh, getting nicely sound musical musical chords. Any other question? Okay, thank you. <laughs>
but yes, everything. Yes, everything. everything. <laughs> Okay, so we will see you at, at five at Copley. <laughs> Someone made a point of one um, from early 2000s, one of the tunes on it. I can't remember the album. Rumpel. Yes, Rumpel. Yes. Rumpel. Yes. Yeah. That's down the ground. Oh, that's the, that's the album. Yeah. Okay, so I do know. Yeah. I can describe that. Oh. Did you put it online? Uh, yes, I've seen yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I subscribe. I, mean, I just have seen transcriptions online. I was playing that more. I'm sorry. Because it was like. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah.
what we have those books. I used to for years I wrote the image of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, is no, uh, no, no. Colleague, oops, and she's uh, running it now. So I'll call it more. Okay. So you can be in touch with yeah. her. Okay. Uh, they do lots of things. I guess I'm sorry. I didn't show uh, today. We're not, no, we're not so looking for on call. Yeah. 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 We actually now, like, a third one call. Call to us. Hey, we love to call. We've got more on call. We have to make a But because you're so cold, and as someone I respect, you know what? If we can put something uh, together, I'd right? be happy to see if we can make that happen. Yeah, so, absolutely. As it does, the least, the least demanding one would be, and then it can be you know, yeah. if you want to throw so a piece of term in this for a while, I'd love to do that. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And like I said, I'll put your in touch with the, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm taking notes of this disagreement because I'm very interested. We're leading it. It's a student, so it's quite great. And we'll see how that is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but it's quite fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Good, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, yeah, good to see you. 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 Yeah, good to see Thank you. Yeah, I should have listened to the talk before I was messing around with it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> to um, the manual structure, are you, yeah. have you gained more, more like confidence? Sorry? Like in, in terms of you playing this as an instrument? Yeah. Are you getting, do you find yourself being able to predict more and more what's uh, going to happen? Or? Why? Well, well, I want you to, uh, to predict the position, also to see, but I found that it's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So it's more like be uh, driven by the ear. Right, so yeah. for example, if you have something, I got a direction, then I get back. Right. So I think I found it in myself, uh, I need more like musical instinct. Mm -hmm. Maybe because it's complex and uh, not something that's like... Yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe uh, modulate, and that would help you. That should be fun. Yeah, right? sure. Maybe they made the different, the different groups would be different relations. Yeah, that would be nice to have these kind of perspectives. So. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. can really, it's going to be even more interesting. You have to write a uh, yeah. unique book. <laughs> it's good to see you again. I'm going to have to take off. Thank you. Yeah, but yeah, very good to see you again. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Maria, thank you for both days. And thank you for speaking clearly. Oh, thank you and so much. And thank you for speaking in energy. Ah. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Thank you. And thank you for not using the mic. Thank you. I try, uh, I, I, this, I try to be clear because uh, when I was a student, I remember when I was in university, I was not to understand it because there was so much jargon and things. So, when it comes to explain and try to do the council, so what I wanted to have when I was a student. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially in, when there are students and they don't understand, they need that simple phrase. So, and yes. each time that it is a new stuff. So. <laughs> but thank you so much for, <laughs> for appreciating the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Microphones are supposed to help people understand, but they, they get in the way. Yeah, because there's not kind of natural. Right, right, right. Yeah, people have to, to modulate their own voice, but also we had we had a tradition in public speaking, even from ancient Greece and Rome. And people did not have a microphone, did not have the eyes, but right. they were talking in public. <laughs> so, right. so yeah, so why don't uh, <laughs> I think that we should be able to do even without the uh, like. The mirrorless technology we have. <laughs> I had a speech teacher who said that she was taught, I hope I'm saying this correctly, that people must be able to understand what you say from one block away, four stories high. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have to project a, a voice. Yes. Well. Yes. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, yeah. I remember when once I took uh, uh, just a semester of CE classes, 
I remember there was a pretty long hall and the teacher was telling us, okay, there is the clock, you have to sing to the clock. Over I see. There. Yeah. I see. And singers do that all the time, especially classical singers, but also speakers do that. And change the volume and thing. Thank you so much for <laughs> At DePaul University, where I did my undergraduate work, there would be a girl student who would sing from one end of a large row, and there would be a boy student at the other end of the large row. And he would know the language that she was singing, wow. but not the text. Okay. Uh, she was not clear. Pardon? Maybe she was not clear well, what she was well, saying. That, 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 that was what was uh, an attempt to, to develop. She, she would sing a phrase, and he would say what he thought that she sang, and she had to keep singing it over and over again until he got it correct. <laughs> singing is hard because it's a kind of natural distort, especially in the female uh, classical singing. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that I learned a lot uh, when I was studying in the US um, because the strain, because even though that um, classical public speaking is coming from our ancient world, but uh, but I think that, but if for example in Italy, nobody is teaching that. I had class in the US where people say, you were at the, the where to make poses, where how to make the melody stuff. Yeah, so that was interesting for me. Mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, also as a non-native speaker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know Italian? No, I don't. But I, I wish I did. And I was just about to say that at the hall, one of the voice teachers was Miss Anne Marie Gertz. Uh, he said Gertz. I guess in, in Germany it's, it would say Gertz, it's Gertz. And she regretted that a situation which had formerly existed was no longer the case. The former situation was that at each vocal studio was attached a coach in Italian diction. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. No, I have been working as a uh, Italian coach for opera singers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the most my uh, how I was living in the US, I was teaching. And I had a fellowship, <laughs> but it was a, I, I used to say a pretty nice experience is because according to the mistakes, uh, my colleagues who were making while singing Italian, I, I learned how I was supposed to pronounce a word. For example, tavolo, table, they were saying tavolo, but it's tavolo, it's not tavolo. <laughs> Or, 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 or for example, like the, the clowns in bubbles, all this stuff. <laughs> At class, I was in the same musical for free. <laughs> At St. John Cantius Church in Chicago, yes. I have been involved in the music. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, we have added to the people involved in the music. Corrado Cavalli as organist. Okay. And uh, Massimo Scappi as well. And they are both from Italia. And uh, one of our conductors went over to 
Springfield. She relocated there. Um, I don't know if her purpose was to sing or to conduct or what but she did all three. Wow. And she left. And so some of us from Chicago have been going there to fill in. And um, we did this for months. And they were supposed to get somebody there. And if I understand correctly, uh, his name is. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking of it. But anyway, he, he's, he's from Italia. Yeah. And he was, he was supposed to have arrived a few months ago and there's a problem with the visa. And so then months ago, it was that he will arrive July 1st. But in any case, yeah. um, there's that situation of getting from one place to the second. Yeah, I think it's kind of soft, and especially, uh, yeah, I think, especially <coughs> where, when I was, uh, it came to the U.S. to study, I had to ask for a visa one year before. Uh, because it was a visa student here, uh, I'm here with a visa that is short, like tourism. Uh, but if, if I want to ask, for example, for a visa for a job, so it would, be, it would have been much longer way. Yeah, for students, it took me, yeah, I have made an application one year before coming in the US and uh, yeah, it took several months. Yeah, this bureaucracy, but it seems that uh, for other countries, it's even worse the time that we need to make a uh, <laughs> Orlando is the one who's supposed to come to uh -huh. it. It is supposed to come to Orlando. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I think it's good. Yeah, it's good. Thank you so much. So, it's wonderful. And, uh, yeah, also feedback from expert people. So, <laughs> it's a lot of good thing. So, see you at the next conference. Yes, yes. Bye. No, 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 it is this. Pero que se pero es que realmente triste que me parece muy o sea, que con su visión con el doctor entonces me da la nación que no se va pero que no está triste
Pero aún sí. Sí, no, no, no. Yo pensé que lo iba a hacer bien muy yo. Sí, anda, no, no, está en la Sí, 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 sí. Yo creo que las actas, Sí, sí, sí. Para todo, ¿eh? Entonces, la discusión de la y él está Que esta vez lo haría mucho mejor. No, 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 Sí, sí, me sí. Me o sea, yo iba hablando con Isaac en el corte cuando vi que alguien se quedaba mirando, me di me la vuelta y dije, ajá, y claro, sí, yo, no, no, no quería hablar con él. Sí, exactamente. Sí, hay muchas cosas. Sí, sí, sí. Pero, sí, sí. 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 No, no, era de antes, entonces no, 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 bueno, por hacer un zoom algún día. No lo mismo, no, no, no. A ver, buscamos un pretexto de Sí. 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 Uh, yeah, let's go to the 14th floor. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, maybe I go to the 
No, yeah, because I think they have cancelled my car reservation. What is it? They have cancelled my car reservation. Oh, you need to go. To I, I don't know. I have a car to go to Sarasota. I am sure. They, I, I'm not sure if they have cancelled me or not. Uh -huh. okay, so I will be without car. Uh, is it? This building is open. Is it? Okay, no problem. I, I have to do my stuff. Go pharmacy. She's going to be at the window. No, no, she can help me. Oh, she knows. Okay, go to the parking lot. Yes, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you able to find out if we were able to have meat for some meals for tonight? They have a menu, but there's a good salmon. Yeah. Yes, like a brand new cheese. <laughs> 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 <laughs>